19th, 2015 uh, meeting of the Board of Selectmen to order. Uh, briefly go over our agenda for the evening. Uh, we will have uh, Selectman's liaison reports and comments, then public comment for items otherwise not on the agenda, and the town manager's uh, report. Uh, then we will have a certificate of recognition for Eagle Scout Duncan Dietz. Uh, we will uh, see a, uh, I don't know if we're seeing a demonstration or just a talk tonight, uh, pro probably more of a talk, but we welcome the uh, robotics team from Merding Memorial High School. They'll be at, on at 7.30 tonight. Then we will have a uh, report from the, our uh, member to the Citizen Advisory Board of the RMLD. Uh, we'll be discussing some solar opportunities for the town at 7.55 and receiving a report from the Climate Advisory Committee at 8 p.m. Uh, then we will be doing a, uh, uh, is that just a certificate, Bob, the Walk Reading Weekend? Yes. Or, okay. Um, there'll be some representatives. There'll be here. some representatives from the walk, uh, Walkable Reading and Trails Committee here, and we have a certificate that we'll be voting for them. Uh, we'll be picking up two continued uh, liquor license hearings uh, for Grumpy Doyle's and Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza at 8.30 and 8.40. And then uh, discussing uh, the Lincoln Street 40B project at 9 p.m. And then finally, uh, five boards and committees have been invited in to discuss uh, their status. If no action is taken by the board, they will sunset on June 30th, and they will be in at 9.30. So uh, with that, can we hear from... Start with John on liaison reports. It's a busy weekend for me personally, so I don't have a, a report this evening. Either. Well, good. I, I, I need the time. <laughs> uh, I see the rest of the balance of my time uh, to the gentleman from Beaver Road. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it has been, uh, I've been busy the last uh, two weeks. I uh, visited the Board of Health. Um, they had a, you know, a very interesting discussion in a couple of different directions. Um, one was um, how we align Territorially, um, they've suggested uh, to the town manager that we consider uh, aligning uh, or realigning, I should say, um, with the Greater River Valley Association where we were previously uh, engaged. And so I think that's a topic of discussion for now. Um, they also um, have been working closely with staff around uh, um, the job description for the for a new health director. <laughs> Um, and they heard a couple of vari a couple of requests for variances. Uh, most importantly, I would say that um, it is a three-person board, um, and they do have one person who needs to resign as a result of uh, time commitments to both business and family, and another whose term is expiring and is not renewing. Mm -hmm. So we'll be engaging um, at least two people. Um, they also engage the idea that uh, given the size of the board, it might not be a bad idea to consider associate membership. Oh yeah, um, because they have struggled with three people. You get quorum. You get in quorum. You know. Why is it three is most important? Don't know the answer to that, Barry. Um, it it didn't come up, and they didn't make the request. Uh, but I do know that it, you know, has over the last year that I've been liaison. It's been uh, the quorum has been an issue for them. You know, um, so. I think that uh, they were pretty happy about the idea that they would might be able to expand, but uh, are probably going to be taking that up at, at another meeting. Um, and I'm going to give the report for the um, ad hoc committee um, for the for the um, committee on firearm safety, and I'm going to do that um, probably for the last time as. Um, we made nominations for uh, both a chair, a vice chair, and a secretary. Uh, for that ad hoc committee. Uh, Kevin Sexton will be the chair. Um, mm -hmm. Bryn Burkhart will be the vice chair, and I'm the guy left taking the notes, so I'll be the, <laughs> I will be the secretary, and that's fine with me. Um, and it was, a, I think, an excellent first meeting. Uh, all the members were present, which was Kevin Sexton and Bryn Burkhart, Jonathan Scully, David Panette, Ken Lafferty, and uh, Deputy Chief uh, was also there along with myself. Um, and essentially what we did was march through the point-by-point -point, uh, um, report that uh, we were asked by the, town, by the town meeting to proceed with this committee around. So that was reviewed. We kind of set an agenda for what we were hoping to accomplish. Um, the meetings were, um, the future meetings out into the midsummer are set now for May 27th, June 8th. 
uh, June 22nd and July 13th. And um, we began with some assignments that are all starting to roll in. Kevin, I just was doing that report Great, for thank you. you so, uh, um, and lastly, um, from a liaison standpoint, I visited uh, Recreation, and they've got a very busy agenda, as you might imagine, in a lot of different directions. Um, right at the moment, there is a, um, uh, a final review of the Birch Meadows su survey that's going to be hopefully released on Thursday um, and that's going to be finalized by the Birch Meadow Committee and the rest of the Recreation Committee um, on um, tomorrow afternoon by conference call. Um, several amplified sound permits were um, approved. Um, there was also a discussion about uh, the operational plan that they're working on um, which I think will be ready for the uh, public hearing on the lights around Birch Meadow. I think that uh, they've done a lot of good work on that already. They've actually begun, uh, the Recreation Committee has been consulting several of the youth organizations that will be involved with the lighting situation. So that's well underway, and I think at our, I think it's at our next meeting, uh, at the June 2nd meeting, there'll be a public hearing around Birch Meadow. So uh, Recreation is working hard on that one. Um, I think that um, one of the other things that's really notable, um, it's so interesting to see how recreation has expanded and how popular it is. Um, the summer camps, for example, and there's a little spreadsheet that was passed out to me. The summer camps that the recreation department was running five short years ago had 202 signups. This year, 546. Oh. So, I mean, in that window of time, it has just grown exponentially. And that doesn't even begin to mention the junior camps, which are kind of a morning and afternoon thing, which are also expanded not as dramatically as, um, you know, 150, 200%, but each and every one of their programs, one's jumping from 85 to 137. The, um, the before camp and after camp programs, again, uh, last year, the after camp programs had 37 participants, 100 this year. Um, 47 before camp, now 91. So the point is that um, clearly recreation is very alive and well um, and, you know, putting out a great product that's greatly subscribed to through, throughout the town. <coughs> Lastly, um, which was not exactly a liaison report, um, but another <coughs> good news report around Boy Scouts. I'm glad we have the Eagle Scout with us tonight. Um, class of 64 for me, so I'm glad <laughs> to have you in the Brotherhood. Um, the um, Troop 702 um, is celebrating this week its 100th anniversary as a continuous Boy Scout mm -hmm. troop. One of, uh, of less than two dozen in the United States that can so, so claim a 100-year wow. history. Um, they had a big celebration of alumni and former scoutmasters and parents uh, on Saturday night, I was asked to come and uh, speak with them. And it was really quite a great night. And they are, I was also asked to pass along that they're having an open invitation following the Memorial Day services at um, Laurel Hill in yep. the Old South Church. They're hosting a general <laughs> reception for everyone. So um, a lot to celebrate in the way of um, recreation, youth programs, and hats off to the uh, Troop 702, who interestingly, the, the real, one of the real stalwarts and person that they call the grandfather of their Boy Scout troop, as a familiar name to all of you, Ben Nichols. Mm -hmm. um, ben was involved in that Boy Scout troop from 1920 till his death at 103, wow. uh, just a couple of years ago, um, continuously registered along that time with, with Boy Scout troop. So it was kind of a good news thing and I thought everybody would like to hear about it. Thank you very much, John. Yeah. Eric? Uh, a couple things. I attended, <coughs> seems like a couple of weeks ago, uh, forever ago, the building committee for, um, for the library. Um, they're, they're moving ahead. Um, they're, they're under budget. They're on time. Uh, an issue that, had, that came up, which uh, took up a, a good chunk of the meeting that I went to, um, dealt with um, some issues around the Port Cashier. Um, that's the, what looks like where they used to draw horses. Up to oh, yeah, yeah. 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 What, when they got the building bids in um, and they were substantially below what they thought, 
they looked at some things to add in. And one of the things that they were going to add in is an innovation lab, um, which is essentially going to do what that port for share is. Um, they're going to glass it and they're going to make usable space oh, okay. around that, which is actually kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, it was the, you know, when they were kind of going through their program, um, mm -hmm. if, they, if the money came in, the innovation lab was going to be kind of the first thing that they'd want to put back in. And so when they were able mm -hmm. to get, uh, when, the, when the construction bids came in significantly lower, they added that back in. But what, what's going to, what it requires, however, is you know how, kind of, I don't have any pictures of it, but you know, there's the four columns. Right. When you go to the front of the building and it has the slate roof on top of it, um, what they're going to need to do because they're going to uh, they're going to dig down and create some usable space on two floors was to pour a foundation. However, when they started digging around there, they found out that the columns, those four columns, that uh, essentially what you see is kind of sitting on a little bit of a concrete slab. Below it, it is just basically rock and fill. So I mean, it survived a hundred and some odd years, but. The contractor just didn't feel comfortable, you know, kind of digging that around that. So, um, what they did, they went back. Uh, they went back. They looked at it, and uh, what the um, what the trustee uh, what the trustees authorized was adding two hundred thousand dollars back into the budget, which will enable them to kind of take that down, pour in the, the foundation, and still build around it. What they did is they authorized the spending. They're going to go back and just see if that they can do it for that two hundred thousand. If they can. They'll still be under budget uh, and create a really good usable space. Mm. If uh, if it looks like it's going to be significantly more than that, they may <coughs> they may potentially scrap it. But they did authorize the spending of that um, of those funds. One thing that I was really impressed, uh, you know, obviously we've all been paying attention to the to the library stuff for a long time. But this is the, the first building committee that I actually sat in on with the building project manager, um, the architect, and, and all the players. Um, I'm really, really impressed with the quality of the people, both from the building committee that the library has, but also the building project manager. They're really paying attention to the details in terms of trying to cut down on costs, um, really on top of all, um, you know, kind of all the issues. So I feel, you know, obviously with any new project that's going to cost $15 million, you're never really <laughs> sure what you're going to find. I feel that this is, there's the right team assembled here. Um, so that was, you know, comforting, at least I know my attending the first meeting. So, um, you know, obviously more on that will uh, evolve next month. I'll probably have some more bids in there, figure out if they're going to be able to actually do this innovation lab. Does that, does that affect the parking pattern that was planned for the no, front? No, okay. no, no. It, it's still going to keep, keep that. Essentially what they're doing is they're going to, they're going to glass in that, that front. And, and but did, did the cars go between the columns in the building before? No. No. Oh, they, no. okay. Um, so oh, up front, okay. Yeah, so that's, yeah, they're still going to do that kind of circular. Huh. Driveway. Um, the other thing I wanted to report on, also another really feel-good thing, is um, uh, Friday night I attended um, the 30th anniversary of um, Understanding Disabilities oh, great. Yeah. Um, event. Um, you know, those those guys do a tremendous mm -hmm. job uh, in expand in ex sort of un expanding the understanding of um, living with disabilities. They they're planning a whole new curriculum. They're on a, a, raise a new fundraising effort where they're trying to basically recruit partners uh, who will basically fund the organization going forward. There was a great speaker that they had, um, Molly Sullivan Sliney, who was a <coughs> former um, Olympic fencer representing the United States, um, gave a speech. She was severely dyslexic growing yeah. up, had no self-confidence until sort of a coach found her and did fencing, and she just gave a tremendously inspiring talk um, about what it was like for her to kind of get that confidence and, and, and make the United States Olympic team. Um, they're doing a tremendous job. Um, they're, they're in every school. They're expanding the curriculum. And um, I know a lot of people here support UD, but um, <coughs> they had their 30th anniversary. It was a real good feel good event. It's awesome, Judy. Julia Blank would be proud of them. Yep. <laughs> She's here still with us. Kevin. Um, I have a couple of reports. I'll, well, on um, one, I attended a site visit for the new proposed 40B. Uh, yep. Project down on Lincoln and <coughs> is that Prescott? Prescott. Yeah. Yep. Um, I, I I don't want to take up too much of time because we're going to be discussing it later on tonight, though. Uh, but I can certainly talk about that um, at that at that portion okay. of the of the meeting. Um, and the same thing as well as I attended the last uh, EDC meeting as well too. So mm -hmm. I know they're going to be yep. uh, able yeah. to see us before tonight. So I'll, uh, in the essence of a of a long night here, I'll save time and not do it twice and and do it when when it mm -hmm. comes up. Okay, I'll be brief. I attended the breakfast meeting with um, 
John, uh, uh, John Halsey, uh, Bob, uh, superintendent of schools and two school committee members, Jesse Wilson. We talked about a potential solar project in Reading, which will also be the subject of a agenda item later this evening, I believe. So I'll uh, defer to that point. So at this point in time, uh, we have the certificate of recognition for Eagle Scout Duncan Dietz. Uh, let me just. Uh, yes. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I skipped over that. Uh, is there any public comment on a, uh, any item not on the agenda tonight? And uh, do you want to? If I could just ask everyone yeah. to sign in. There's a sign in yep. in the corner as you leave, if you could sign in. <coughs> sorry about that. Do you have a brief report uh, at this time? If you don't mind, a couple of things really fast. Sure. Um, I was at a, an emergency management uh, meeting today in Wakefield with 19 other communities. We're a group of 20. Mm -hmm. Um, to John uh, Halsey's comment earlier about the health region, region um, fire, police, health, and this emergency management group all have different groups that are different cities and towns. It's completely insane. Um, and we had a presentation today from a woman at the state um, in charge of emergency management and public health. Mm -hmm. She said the same thing. She said, you know, yet another group that's not correlated to anything else. But I have to say, the group of 20 that met in Wakefield is um, highly organized. Um, as is often the case, Reading was represented uh, by nine people. Most cities and towns send one or two. Um, so again, the cities and towns look to Reading to figure out how to deal with a crisis if there's a regional one. Um, you know, led by Greg Burns, we really do have a very strong team and a very strong presence. Um, I wanted to thank very much the Garden Club this weekend at an event that I know a couple of selectmen were able to get to. They had their plant sale out on the common. And uh, thanks to Jesse and over there on the new group called the Cultural Connection Reading uh, that has loosely formed a, a bunch of area cultural groups were out on the common. We didn't have the music because they were afraid it was going to rain, but we had all the artists except for the watercolor film. <coughs> and that was really nice. I, I got a lot of compliments. I've received some very nice emails about it. The Garden Club has already signed up to do the same thing next year since the library will probably still be under construction. Um, they were thrilled. They said it's uh, as good an event as they've had, and they sold out faster than usual. So it worked out really Thanks well. It's almost like we've been board. doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yes. It's almost like we've been doing it every year. Um, I do want to also to follow on to Barry's comments about the library project. It is going well, knock on wood. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 o'clock down at the temporary library, um, there's a project update for the public if the public wishes to attend. Quite often, the letters attend. And I'll agree with uh, Barry's comments that um, you know, the, the project management on this is very strong. And that also includes mm -hmm. Joe Huggins from DPW. Um, <coughs> and measured by complaints by the neighborhood, it's a perfect project. I've received zero. <laughs> uh, Seriously? Wow. Just imagine That's that. really good. Yeah. Wow. That doesn't mean there aren't any, but I haven't received Have any. Have they killed everybody in the neighborhood? <laughs> I, think, uh, I wonder. <laughs> You know, some neighbors are still walking in there trying to return books. They've had to put up a sign saying the library's closed. <laughs> um, but really, from a pub public relations and a neighborhood impact um, standpoint, the heavy construction has not yet gone on, but the demo was, was pretty intense. Um, it's being very well managed, and, and communication, more importantly, is, is working very well. That's good. That's all I have. Thanks, Bob. Okay, now the time has come to uh, recognize Eagle Scout Duncan Deans. Duck, would you like to stand up and maybe introduce the members of your family? I see your mom is here. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anybody else you want to introduce? Yeah. We're get, we're duty okay, gotcha. Yep, no problem. Uh, I'm going to read this certificate. I, Barry, if you want to offer a few comments uh, afterwards. This certificate is hereby, is a certificate of recognition awarded to Duncan Dietz in recognition of his achieving the Eagle Scout Award for his service project in which he worked with the Beverly Bootstraps Food Pantry in Beverly, Emmaus House in Haverhill, and Lazarus House in Lawrence, I'm very familiar with them, to create 300 personal hygiene kits for the homeless clients of these three charities. Given this 19th day of May 2015 by the Board of Selectmen. Barry, do you want to add any comments? Um, we'll, we'll be here all night. <laughs> um, if we go through the list of this lad's accomplishments, um, I, I'm incredibly impressed. Duncan um, passed his um, uh, Eagle Board of Review in November, and is going to be getting uh, going through the um, uh, Court of Honor on May 31st. We'll all be presenting him officially his yeah. his uh, his, um, his award. Um, Duncan is a senior at St. John's Prep. 
um, and going to graduate. Actually, actually, you graduated. Two days. Two days. Yeah. Okay. Nice. Very good. Nice. Congratulations. So, uh, so, so what are you doing? You got to get a, get a job. And <laughs> uh, but in addition to being an Eagle Scout, Eagle Scout, um, Duncan was a Saber captain in the varsity fencing team, mm -hmm. a member of the campus ministry, um, student advisory committee, member of the mock trial team. Uh, and in his spare time was an officer of the Philosophy Club, mm. and chair of the Spire Society, which assists the Office of Admissions, uh, is a member of the National Honor, so Honor Society and German Language National Honor Society, mm. um, and he plays the French horn mm. um, in the St. John's Prep concert, concert band. Um, he's a, is an altar server, at, uh, an Eucharist minister at St. Agnes, um, and in the fall is gonna be mm. going to um, State University of New York at Binghamton um, on a pre-law track. Uh, I want to also say something too, one of his accomplishments this year, uh, <coughs> for the first time, and I hope will be of many times, Duncan voted for the first time. In, oh, nice. And showed up to the polls in a jacket and a tie. <laughs> and and, and, and attest to that. Uh, that's not a requirement. <laughs> no. um, and, uh, and also just a little bit about, a little bit about his project. Um, you know, as, as uh, Dan mentioned, he worked um, in creating uh, personal hygiene kits for, for the homeless. Um, but the way he did it, too, is that he engaged with folks from the parish and the Reading Police Department um, and, and advertised it, also engaged help from the rest of his troop. And he created these 300 kits, which contained items such as comb, shampoo, soap, toothpaste, toothbrushes, floss, um, deodorant. And his fundraising was so successful that he was able to donate excess mm -hmm. supplies and make monetary contributions to these organizations. Mm -hmm. So that is incredible. <laughs> um, I feel really comfortable knowing that the future of the country <laughs> is in good hands with, <laughs> with people like, like Duncan. Um, you know, those of us who play sports, we see once in a while, we see athletes that are just God-given talent. <laughs> most of them, and most of all of us, we don't have that God-given talent. We have to learn these things. And leadership <laughs> is a learn. Uh, is a learned skill. Mm -hmm. And the work that you've done as an Eagle Scout in your community, that's a learned skill. And hopefully that you'll uh, translate to other people in your community. And it's something that um, Angela and, and, and Jeff, you should feel really proud uh, of the work that Duncan's done. And, and we're proud of you in Reading for all the work that you've done here. And we wish you a lot of, a lot of success in Binghamton and come back, we can use your help. Thank you. Thank you. And being a member of the German club, you'll appreciate this. Ausgezeichnet. Want to translate? <laughs> so, <laughs> it's excellent. Okay. Yeah, up on that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, nicely done, John. Do you have any? Comments? No, I, yeah. you know, um, as I said, welcome to the Brotherhood. I mean, you'll you'll be an Eagle Scout all of your life, and it will take you in places that hmm. you'll just not believe. Hmm. Um, and it'll be it's a it's a great accomplishment, but the future of what you've accomplished is all in front of you, not behind you. Uh, let's oh, read the we'll motion, uh, the motion. Uh, and then we'll, we will do that. Move that yeah. the Board of Selectmen award a certificate of recognition to Duncan Dietz in recognition of his achieving the Eagle Scout Award. Is that second? Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? 5 0. Okay. Uh, is this going to be presented now? Okay. Uh, okay. Can we give it to you? Yeah. 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 Okay. Come on up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. again guys okay want us up there too go ahead <laughs> why don't you come back here we'll get we'll a picture back we'll move oh, yeah.
Okay, I am now pleased to uh, welcome back for return engagement the RMHS robotics team. And uh, if we could have one of the leaders come up and be introduced, a couple of the, uh, the team leads. Uh, Who would like to be the spokesperson? Um, hi, I'm Caitlin Maloney. Hi, Caitlin. I came last time, so if you know me, I'm a senior in high school, and I'm one of the co-presidents. Um, so our team is Holly, Alex, Jeff, Tim, James, Jack. <laughs> Take it away. So uh, one other person that we have is uh, our mission statement. And one of the things that we try to do as a team is we try to uh, promote the STEM initiatives uh, within like our group with either business and the technology that we use. And we also try to collaborate with uh, our mentors and other uh, FRC teams to help gain life skills that will help us outside of school. So many of you have probably seen the slide before. Uh, this is about First, which is the organization which is in charge of all this. Uh, they have the four levels, and in Reading we have two of the levels, which is the FLL team, which is the first Lego league, and the FRC team, and uh, we're up to the FRC team. And uh, that's kind of like, a, I don't know, what we do it, call it is the varsity sport for the mind. It helps us just <laughs> like, uh, yeah, it trains our minds to be players, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but our team has uh, grown over the past three years since we started in 2013. Uh, we've almost doubled every season that we've had it. Right now we have 47 students. Uh, uh, two of those students are actually juniors uh, from Parker. They, they know, uh, Jack and Thomas are both from Parker, and they've actually been a great help for our team. We can't wait to officially have them on the team uh, next year as high schoolers. Uh, and another thing is we have 15 mentors, which are all professionals and uh, like leaders that help us throughout the thing and they're great help and not just like telling us what to do but leading us so we can are able to do that ourselves one day. And our team aspects are just little categories on uh, what we can do inside the team. And so we have seven different categories and this allows the kids to be able to choose what they want to be focused on and this doesn't just include working on the robot, it also includes business teams uh, and other technological things that you can do outside the robot. For example, I'm on the website team, and so that's on the business side, and I barely ever touch the robot, but I also get experience of stuff that I want to do and also <coughs> want to go into later on. Right? So besides our team structure, which is actually new this year, um, one of the biggest changes that our team had was moving into our new shop space, which is right next to the superintendent's <coughs> office in the high school. Um, so that was really great, and it's also a nice bigger space. And um, that actually allowed us to receive a CNC machine, which was um, donated to us from the Northeastern University team. Um, and it's worth about $35,000, which is really awesome. Mm -hmm. And we're able to um, machine really cool oh. parts, such as our logo, which we um, <laughs> actually carved out, which is our test mm -hmm. of the CNC machine. So you can take a look at that. We filed with the church work. <laughs> <laughs>
fundraising and outreach efforts. Um, we also hosted our district event, which um, you guys helped us a lot with, and also a few of you came to and saw. Um, so that was really fun for us. And we also tried to improve our social media outreach um, on our Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and website, um, and did a lot of other fundraisers and community events. Um, so this is our fundraising for the year. Um, this just shows kind of where we get our funding from. Um, as you can see, a lot of our funding this year came from our district event. We made a lot of money off of that. Um, we also get a lot of our money from corporate sponsors by submitting grants and doing presentations to them. Um, and as you can see, we also spend a lot of money. Um, so we spent a lot this year um, getting things organized for our district event and also of course putting the robot together. Um, and as you might notice, there is a slight gap in between um, what we raised this year and what we spent. And that was because um, mm -hmm. even though we qualified to attend the World Championship in St. Louis this year, we actually decided to um, stay at home and we're going to reinvest some of that money in the future of the team and try to buy new tools and equipment. Cool. What do you think your uh, steady state budget is going to be going forward? It's kind of um, bouncing around there. What do you think we need to do? This year we had it at, I think it was 49000 um, And we actually did exceed that. Yeah. So um, depending on what we can buy with the extra money this year, we might lower it a little bit about 45000 Like, what do you think we need to run the program? Forty to 45 grand a year? Yeah. And does that include a trip? Because that you only spent thirty six thousand. That includes so that includes um, entry fees for both of our district events that we attend. So we do two district mm -hmm. events, and then if we qualify for um, the district championship, which we have the past two years, um, that would also cover that entry fees and travel for that. What do you think the maximum capacity of the program is in terms of participants? Um, I wouldn't say we have a maximum capacity. Um, of our schedule, which we'll talk about a little later, we do allow a lot of flexibility, so there are kids just coming and going every night. Um, so it's very easy to have, you know, a large amount of people as long as they're not all there on the same night. Of course, it's fairly fit everyone into our shop. Um, so is forty-seven sixty-one the name of your friend there? Yeah, no, actually, her name is Patricia. Okay. Um, okay. Formal. <laughs> Formally, it's Patricia. Um, Forty-seven sixty-one is actually our team number, so every team that competes. Well, then that's number. hence okay. the uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, rocket. Seven is taken apparently. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we tried to like rearrange the letters; they wouldn't let us do that. All right. So if we we have Patricia outside on a nice expansive lot. What would we be seeing right now? Right. If you could. We'll talk about that. Can you? Later. Okay. All right. Actually, we're going to try to do it now. Okay. Uh -huh. We're actually going to get into that. Excellent. Right, uh, right about now. Actually. All right. So this year's challenge, it was a bit different than previous years, but I'm not talk about that now. Um, so we have these totes, which are about yay big, mm -hmm. um, and you, stuff, you stack them up to score points, and then if you put an industrial size trash can on top, you get extra, like triple the points. Mm -hmm. So our team's focus was to put the caps on them, so that's the next. So our robot, which mm -hmm. is right there. I don't know if you can see it. Um, yeah, they can, they can pivot. <laughs> um, so it was actually quite interesting this year. For the first time, we padded our entire robot, which is the picture on the left. And so we used skills from our school using the Intro to Engineering and Design class. And those kids that took that class actually built that 3D model. And we used that to translate into Drifter right there. <laughs> and uh, so it was really interesting to actually get to use skills from what we were taught in an application that turned into a real thing. Yeah. And so I don't know if you've heard, but we actually hosted a district. We <laughs> 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 did. Um, <laughs> might have mentioned it a few times. <laughs> but, um, it was the first year, and first and us, we both consider it a huge success. We had a huge crowd come in and see what our team does and the full community, the first community does. And 40 teams participated, so there was a lot of people there. Um, and we actually had judges from Reading. We had Dr. Doherty, who's the superintendent of schools. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know her. You might know <laughs> <say. Never heard. laughs> <laughs> and we also had the new principal at RMHS, Mr. Adam Bacher, yep. and they were 
great judges, and I think it was a great experience for them to actually see what we do. And yeah, we brought in everybody from the community to see that. You guys uh, didn't get a chance. Bob and I went for maybe an hour. It's, it's kind of a combination between a WWF match <laughs> <laughs> and busters and a small software. <laughs> 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 it's the most bizarre thing I've ever seen. They first started the best te uh, audio visual equipment I've seen yeah, inside the school, bar yeah. none. Um, simulcast to at least one other spot. I think there may be a couple, but uh, just remarkable. The most confusing part of the evening is the teams actually throw objects into the playing field. We, we didn't figure that part out <laughs> until just tonight. But <laughs> they lay the playing field out, which made perfect sense, but then halfway through, people are throwing things onto the field of play, which turned out to be part of the game. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect for us. Yeah. And even though the first competition was a great success, our team also had a stellar season this year. Mm -hmm. As it was mentioned before, we qualified for the World Championships, and we were at three, dis three events Two of them were district, one of them was our own, so that was an interesting experience because I'm usually with the robot, but with the competition going on, I actually volunteered and helped set up the field every time, so that was a different perspective. Was also. she lonesome? Maybe a little bit, yeah. Um, but, so in our district, we ranked 11th and actually ended up in the alliance and that's a great big deal because we get to choose two partners and compete in an elimination round. And uh, we actually got some semifinals. We were so close, but at the last second, one of the stacks fell and the points uh. got deducted. So we were almost fucked up. Something to shoot for next year. But yeah, that's something to shoot for. And so at both districts that we went to, we actually won the entrepreneurship award, which was a huge thing for our business team, which we really got organized this year. And we were the only first team in New England to win the entrepreneurship award at both the districts we went to. So it was a great job for our business team this year. And uh, then through that, we'll move on to the Rhode Island district where we ranked 17th. We again qualified for the semifinals, and, or the elimination round, and we were a quarterfinalist this time. And that, through those, we qualified for the New England Championship <laughs> again. And we were among the 60 best teams in New England. How do they determine the winner of the Entrepreneurship Award? Um, what, what's that based on? So we propose a business plan every year, mm -hmm. um, or you can. And our business team proposed a really good one. Um, but they take all the business plans from all the teams that participated in the um, events and basically they read through them and see which one was the best. Hangs together. Yeah. The criteria that I have. And they have a panel of judges who decide and vote on it. Very good. Yeah. See, to me, that that's one of the, the bigger accomplishments is that is that yeah. award. I mean, that's that's your hmm. that's your your life's moving forward kind of thing, you know, this is how it's going to be out in the real world, yep. uh, type of thing. That's that's huge that you won those awards at both districts. It's great. Yeah, we're really proud of our business. Yeah, you should be, that. yeah. All right, so we can move on to the So. So what comes next? You have a lot of things planned in the future. You plan on giving back to the Reading community, and you're you know, focusing on the elementary and middle school. You want to appeal to more, more to them especially girls, because there's not many girls in the science program. Mm -hmm. So, you have two more girls here. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies. <laughs> we're losing one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so we're hoping to get more girls in the future. And we also plan on getting team workshop for the preseason. So the preseason is where we do most of our planning, like teach kids how to do things. So during the build season, they know what to do. And they tend to find the niche there, like what they plan on. So as you see, we're pretty involved in our community. We've done many events through past and hopefully in the future. So some of the things that we have planning on doing sometime in the near future are for middle school assembly. So those include people more so that um, middle school students want to become senior members or maybe think about joining the team when they teach it. It's kind of like the minor leagues. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so we 
our goal is to create a science expo for middle school and elementary school students who do STEM things and want to show off their work. So there's a lot of like cool projects that kids do, but they don't have a chance to show anyone it, and this is their chance. So we're planning on posting it sometime in November, and we're planning on working on the presentation. So these are the events that we're planning on doing this year, for the rest of this year, I guess. And as you see, we have some assemblies and some middle school. Mm -hmm. And also, if you want to find us more places, we have the writing pen pens and family day and the street fair that you can find us. And then any questions? Hmm. Where's well. Patricia's brother and sister? <laughs> I mean, what happened to the ancestors? They don't are. tell me, don't tell me you we, we, turned we them into Patricia. <laughs> oh, no. One, one of them is getting reassembled soon, okay. hopefully. <laughs> yep. They had to stay at home because they were tired. <laughs> you might want to go visit the uh, Reading Rotary Club again, because that's actually how yeah. you ended up here. <laughs> uh, not tonight, but, you know, some time ago. Yep. That, that was a great visit that you had yep. there, and then... I think there's a lot of people in that club that would be very interested in how you've progressed, you know, since the last time you visited. Because you know, it's a great story, and what you've done has just been spectacular yeah. since that time. So, because I think that was late last year you visited there. Yes, it was. Yeah, yeah. December. Yeah, yep. and that was a great visit. Yeah, that was. Well, Barry, Barry talked earlier about uh, mm -hmm. about skill not being necessarily something that uh, we're all born with. Strikes me, this is a great environment for kids that have interest, but maybe not the right demonstrated uh, familiarity with the subject matter. Um, and you're obviously reaching out to younger and younger members of the team, so you've got a chance to bring people in not just for three or four years, but even potentially more than that. It's a tremendous uh, huh. asset and add on to our educational experience right. for you know, tomorrow's leaders in many ways. And the part you're really maybe not going to understand to get out in the business well is how important it is that you learning you're learning the concept of team work at an early age we didn't have anything like this many moons ago when i went to high school it was all individual stuff dinosaurs yeah. roaming the earth. yeah <laughs> <laughs> who, who let him in but uh, uh software is built today in small teams using agile development i mean this is a perfect segue if you're going into many fields uh, that, that involve teamwork together so no. That, that's the part I wanted to uh, remark on, um, having seen the competition of Google on the year and having just done the second round of college tours with my youngest daughter. <laughs> um, you guys have accomplished what colleges hope parents believe they will accomplish for their children, and you've already done it. Yeah. Um, the big thing on college campuses now for this liberal arts is integrated education. Mm -hmm. Teachers that actually talk to each other, that actually work together, yeah. and there's some deliverable that involves more than one skill. No one of your accomplishments stands out so much as the way the group works together. Yeah. Yeah. You know, really, you'll find that to be the most useful skill as you go on, I think, uh, as much as any single individual skill you learn. Yeah. And, and actually, you, you do mirror the real world. In fact, you actually maybe lead the real world in that. Um, what I was really impressed with is the fact you actually had a business plan um, and that you mm -hmm. raised a significant amount of money. Now, all of us have participated, whether it be youth sports or you know, the science club and everything, and, and the fundraising plan essentially is to stand outside Tamula's with a can, um, yes. whereas you guys <laughs> actually came up with a plan. Now that robot that you built was probably will probably be obsolete, maybe it already is obsolete, because the next robot that you're gonna build is gonna, you know, far outpace it. But the ability to kind of get the word out and raise money and do the funds, and raise the funds for it, is really what's gonna lead it, because, you know, the robot is great, but without all those other things, you can't build or promote the robot. So, um, and it also gives a chance for other kids who may not be science inclined, but who might be entrepreneurial inclined to, to really get involved with it. Um, and, and really, you're, you'll be greater than the sum of your parts. So, um, um, good job. So, if you, you can do a demo of the robot right at the front. Yeah, whatever. Awesome. Oh, sure. <laughs> As long as there's no selectmen are harmed in the uh, <laughs> operation. <laughs> 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 Have you ever seen the movie RoboCop? <laughs> yes, yes. That's what I had in mind, actually. <laughs> this is great. Got, got 911.
my speed dial here. <laughs> Tom Mixer. <laughs> Toon Hall's out. He's talking too much. Yeah. <laughs> Of the grouch out. Alright, so what I'm going to need you to do, so do not break it. Oh, well, that's good. Okay. So we'll move the elevator up and down, open okay. the conveyor belts in and out, so that we load in totes through that chute into the robot, stack them up inside the robot, and we're ready to put them up in your stack. Okay. All you got to do is press and hold that button right there. Alright. <laughs> For each one, just hold it. Press and hold until I tell you to stop. Do I need practice run? No, one try, one try. One try, one try. It's not high, don't worry. Alright, press and hold. It's tough. The dog will go fast. Oh, okay. Go ahead. It's like the bag of Chandler. <laughs> 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 okay, yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you. That's how your luggage gets to the plane. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now um, Jake, our, our operator, put those totes onto that other tote. Hi. Oh, nice. <laughs> now the piece that is a stance. Oh, look at this, huh? <laughs> so normally in the game, the, you get the most points by stacking the totes six totes high, but I skewed a little bit low, so we're not going to try that. <laughs> so the next thing we're going to show you is moving that uh, can and putting it on top of that stack. So can we have another volunteer? Sure. <laughs> yeah, we have the tank. That's right. So I need you to activate that piston right there, moving that hook up, spinning that can inside the robot, and move that conveyor belt. No problem. It's just okay. like big clothes, guys. <laughs> All you gotta do is press that button or the lazy button. The lazy button. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so the two operations I had volunteers perform are examples of automatic. 
animation that we put into the robot. We realized that a big part of this game, being able to play it efficiently and fast, because we have a limited amount of time, two minutes and 30 seconds per match, mm -hmm. is to pre-program all these buttons so you just gotta press it once and it does everything for you. Doing that by hand would just take forever. So that helped us play the game really well and it was, we used multiple sensors and learned a lot of new things from the computer. So we'll have Jake top that stack if he can and finally score the points that we were gonna match. Awesome. How many, how many of these designs are kind of uh, just the macro you talked about earlier with all these steps? How many of those are kind of invented? The concepts were invented here, or the little expanding hands on How much was that developed here? The well, concept that, for it. What do you mean? Like, um, as in developed here? Your idea. Your stupid idea. Oh, this was all our group's idea. Everything that was created on this robot was our idea. We do share some ideas with other teams, and there are basic concepts that we share. That's a big part about first is. You can create an idea, you can create a unique idea. It's awesome if you share it with other teams and you can expand on it and grow on it. A lot of these concepts right now were ones that our team created and that we will be sharing with other teams. Hmm. Right. Cool. Very cool. Oh. Yeah, that's another question right there. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the demonstration and best of, best of luck to all of you. Okay. Let's, uh, we'll take about a five minute recess. Uh, Feel free to take pictures, et cetera. Cool. Sure. Yeah. yeah. How about the robot? <laughs> yeah. yeah, the robot, of course. I gotta get out front. Yeah. Let's see. Which, where are you gonna take it? Wait, which angle are you taking? Does from? this work? No. From this way? Yeah. Okay. Okay, that works. All right. You want to? Good. Come on, get in here. Back it all out. Who's taller? <laughs> Short guys up front. <laughs>
majority who said, I feel like I can just quit right now if you're growing up in that kind of thing. Seriously. Really? Yeah. It's so impressive. Yeah. And um, any, any number of them can stand up and supplement and do it. Right so, which That's not me as a kid. No way. Absolutely not. That's the, the, the uh, it's really such a great program. Yeah. And it's only, it's only as good as the enthusiasm that these kids show for it, which is just un unbelievable. Yeah, that Thank you very much. Awesome. Have a good night. Thank you. you Great job. Okay, now let's talk about the 48. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> let's just move to adjourn. <laughs> but we have an illegal meeting anyway. I mean, what's that? We have an illegal meeting. Yeah. Only according to one person. Yeah. That was, I love to see the <laughs> film at 11 on that one. Jeez. You'd have loved to have seen the expression on Matt's, Matt Cornell's Okay. Hey, you're going to send me his resume so I can call him up. Oh, that's right. When you think of it, I like to get together. Okay. I will. Got to write that down. I won't remember. That was so much fun. I love that. That was easily the best, one of the best meetings we've had. <laughs> it's not even, there's not even, it's not even close. Dave, just keep coming back and meet. We can get him to come every two weeks. It'd be good for me. I'm loving it all so far. Boy Scouts, robotics. Kidding me? Last night, you know, sponsored Hitting for the cycle, huh? The school can just kind of skip right there. Walk them over, Eddie. That's it. All right. You know what I forgot? What? I'll do it next meeting. My report on the audit. I thought that was you. Okay. Yeah, Dan Ensminger. How are you? Hey, nice to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Great. Welcome. Hi, Julie. I'm John Halsey. You're welcome. Yes. I saw, you how I, I saw you be assigned on TV. Yes. I, I was watching. I was lurking. Did you notice that really no one else volunteered? No. Very easy group to get to know. And I you notice it, it's like an initiation. They send a new <laughs> person over. See if they come back. I think it's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sorry, last night just from a What's that? I congratulated the superintendent on his uh, adept re uh, response on the Joshua Eaton principle. The, the two primary candidates backed out, so he assigned, he got the Birch Meadow vice to step, step up and take the position. Pretty pretty good turning on a dime. Yeah. yeah. Now they of course have to replace that position. That, that's it. Think about that. Don't need. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, reconvene. Okay, we're going to pick up with the uh, Citizens Advisory Board uh, member report. Uh, David Mancuso, front and center. Uh, for those uh, in the audience, uh, the Citizens Advisory Board is, uh, please, that's a good place. Uh, that is the selectmen's uh, representation uh, to the RMLD Board of Commissioners. Each of the four towns has a member. One or more members, I think Wilmington has two members. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of in proportion to the power <coughs> consumed by each town. And uh, David is kind of our eyes and ears, uh, takes our comments back to the, the board. So, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure. Um, appreciate the opportunity to address you all tonight. Um, you know, there's an old adage in the entertainment business, never follow dogs or kids, <laughs> but they have robots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So um, I, we, I don't think I can compete. We tried to book Letterman, but he wasn't available exactly. yet. Yeah. Exactly. He will be third. He will be. Yeah. So <laughs> just a, a couple of things. Um, it's budget season, and so I thought it would be worth mentioning quickly that the, um, the CAB has a approved a $10.5 million CapEx budget and an OpEx budget, which gives us about an 86 
million dollar bond. Capital and operating. Capital and operating, yes. Um, The uh, Chairman Talbot and I were just talking. uh, The CapEx budget has been approved by the commissioners. Um, They're going to be looking at the operating expense budget soon. Mm -hmm. Um, And so um, it's really driven, the 10.5 number is really driven, I think, by the organization's attempt to get much more, become much more proactive than they have been in the past. Um, The feeling of the general manager is expressed to the CAB is that they have been doing a lot of things traditionally there in a very reactive basis and that you're going to try and get ahead of that curve. Um, It makes sense. It's an investment. Mm -hmm. But when you start to look at things like grid security and and reliability, um, there's some pretty good sound investments that are going to be made in in really moving ourselves a little bit ahead of the the curve for the for the the um, for the company. Um, the thing that I would mention about that um, is that well, the CAB has requested that moving forward, uh, when we review budgets, we do the operating expense budget first mm-hmm. and the capital expense budget second. Um, we asked about it this year. Apparently, it was just the way things sort of fell and were organized, but um, it sounds like that will be acceptable to the general manager so that we can look at what kind of income do we have before we start looking at what kind of money we spend moving forward. A couple of notable things out of that review, um, keeping in mind that 83 or 84% of the budget in RMLD is really about keeping the lights on, literally, um, and then the smaller portion is about staff and and, and operations. Um, The important thing I wanted to point out is that load is declining. So with efficiency and folks using less electricity, the very thing that's, that RMLD is selling, we are selling less of it. There's about a uh, decline of 1% projected in terms of actual load for next year. Um, good on one hand, um, because we're using less electricity. Um, obviously, that leads to questions about the sustainability and the financial side of things, because all we have to sell right now is electricity. Um, the ideas on the table for generating more revenue are, are starting to be discussed. Um, there was some talk about the fact that we are in a very high cost energy state, that RMLD has some of the lowest energy rates in electricity rates in the Commonwealth, um, and that's an asset that the communities have the opportunity to sell as part of an economic development effort. Um, that really, growing that load is one way um, to ensure that we can continue to provide some rate stability. Um, and not necessarily have to get into a model where we're constantly having to raise rates, although the general manager has warned that we're likely to see more rate increases just by the nature of the energy industry, the cost of energy that we're purchasing to redistribute, and then uh, the, just the operations itself of RMLD. One of the other ideas uh, which will be discussed is um, trying to take advantage of some of the broadband capabilities, the dark fiber that we have in the ground. Mm-hmm. Um, Chairman Talbot and I were just talking about it a moment ago trying to figure out whether or not there's some assets there that we can leverage on behalf of Reading and all of the other communities. Um, that could be as simple as something that is really just community-based, where we try and, and bring benefit to the individual communities themselves. It could be something that uh, might be commercialized. Um, there are a few towns, that I think there's about 10 out of the 351 towns that provide broadband and cable services to the community. Whether that's practical, we'll look at. There's some discussion on the CAB agenda tomorrow night about um, about looking at a study or trying to dive into that so we can learn a little bit more. So this is broadband that's part of the command and control center for the running the power? Correct. Okay. Right. So and that's, so that's in place and you're look, you have some spare bandwidth. That right. So it's, you know, of that fiber that's sitting in the ground that isn't being utilized, is there some way to either commercialize that or bring additional benefit to the town that might mm-hmm. either reduce costs or increase sure. revenue overall? Was that, would that be turning it into a, com- a competing service? Um, that that it, it could. That would be the extreme uh, of actually saying that you wanted to offer cable and broadband services and go out into the open market and compete. Um, as I said, there's a couple of there's ten ten or a dozen towns that do that yeah. um, in the Commonwealth. The circumstances are a little bit different in each of them. Um, I think the the CAB will be talking more about this tomorrow night. This is very preliminary discussions about are there other alternative ways Mm -hmm. besides growing load or in addition to growing load to generate some revenue Um, because it's a long-term concern. If we can't find ways to continue 
to generate revenue, then the burden is going to increase on the ratepayer um, in order to be able to, to subsidize the, the expenses of the organization. Is there any path for a, uh, uh, a, a town that adjoins a service area or, say, the rest of Linfield to petition the DTE to join the RMLD? Uh, is, is, or is that kind of an impossible um, thing to know, think You know, I, I won't claim to be an expert. Yeah. I think there are some barriers. Dave, if you know the answer, feel free to. I have to. no idea. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. There's some big challenges that would yeah. we would yeah, likely sure. face to do that. I mean, it's conceivable. Equipment, among others. Y yes, exactly. You'd have to so. buy out some equipment, probably. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, right. You know, is it a possibility? It, yes, um, I think it is. And they could benefit it, from your low rates. You could sell more power, et cetera. It would just yeah. be an extreme situation yeah. where, before the DPU, we'd have to we'd have to build a pretty big case of why the, the town should move, and and then we'd have to look at the expense side. I, right. I think it's the same thing as what, why it's harder now for municipal light companies to actually even get started, that the for-profit light companies have really put barriers oh. so they don't want any runoff from very there. Very political. There's yeah. actually a statute in place that you, you yeah. can no longer start a municipal yeah. light, light and department. And I would imagine poaching the, from another, well, from a for-profit. It would, it would be a very interesting yeah. dynamic, let's put it that way. Nothing happens by chance in the right. state house. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nice case law. Though. <laughs> so, yeah, it, it's, it would be an extreme, I think, oh. kind of an extreme situation to, to chase that It's way to to expand is to do more of what you're doing, though, to the point where we don't have half of Linfield. Is it even in the realm of economic possibility that you'd buy out the, the other providers, the other half of the town? I don't know. I'll bring that back to the organization and ask. It certainly is. It's certainly something to talk about. That's that's a good bit of input that I can I can poke around a little bit more on. Um, one other thing that out of the capital uh, budget that I wanted to point out is, which I think is very positive, and this goes to the idea of what we can do as a municipal that others can't is the idea of some planned distributed generation. Um, the idea of putting a generator in place, um, it would be a two megawatt generator. It would cost about $2 million, and essentially its function would be to help us reduce peak power usage on the most heavily um, uh, uh, traffic days, essentially. So uh, the way power, the way budgets are set, the way prices are set, is relative to the idea of how much capacity do we need to accomplish, to ensure that we have all the electricity we need when we need it on a hot summer day, right. or on the hol you know during the holiday season. So there's really ten critical days where if we can suppress that peak, if we can actually lower the amount of energy we have to buy. We can lower the overall cost as well. Mm -hmm. So it's um, not something that everybody gets to do. We as a municipality mm -hmm. can. Um, and I think the CAB's feeling was it brings some very tangible benefits. Um, the way the numbers have played out, it's not big money, but by having the peaker, you know, the industry, industry term peaker, um, we would be looking at saving ratepayers about $5 a year, each ratepayer about $5 a year. Um, and that would continue. The investment's a pretty much a one-time investment. This is capital equipment that will last a long, long time. Um, its shelf life is very long. It's only going to run very few hours out of the year. Um, and so it's kind of a short-term investment to be able to have much longer-term gain, particularly as the capacity market is changing and the cost of energy is changing. So it gives us a little more flexibility to control our own destiny. Okay, Barry. Dave, don't you, uh, uh, RMLD, have the capacity right now to change the way the metering runs so that if you use your energy... Um, on off-peak hours, it's less per kilowatt than, let's say, you do during. So you can basically kind of choose when you use your electricity. Yep. And that way, obviously, save the rate payer, the individual rate payer money. But also, if everybody does it, then as a community, we're buying less. We're buying less of the more expensive yep. energy. Is so that that's the time. Just available to commercial customers. I know it's no. been available for years. But no, yeah, time it, of it's, that's it's time of use. Mm -hmm. right. so, okay. yeah, yeah, so it's a, it's actually a, a billing plan. And yeah. you can agree to use off-peak energy. So if you wanted to do your dishes and your laundry and all those, you know, those heavy electricity use ap uh, applications, and you did it at off-peak. And I can't recall the hours. David, do you know what the? Well, noon to 7 p.m. Okay. Is the on-peak. Right. So if you shift to your heavy users to the morning or evening, mm -hmm. your, your dryer, your dishwasher, your, your heavy load, you can save. You know, the flip side of that is... Sure, could you just identify yourself for the audience? Oh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Tom Olala, I'm an engineer with Reading Municipal Light. 
Thank you, Tom. The, in fact, the important part, I think, for the consumer on those plans is that you really understand what your usage patterns are and you're willing to alter them. Right. And so the folks at RMLD will actually talk the customer through what their actual usage has been to help them understand whether it's practical for them or not. So it might not be practical, for example, for a senior citizen who just isn't up late at night. It might not be practical for a large family that has to run laundry all day because there's young kids. You know, but RMLD will actually go through the time and the effort to talk you through those plans to make sure you understand what the opportunity is. I'm not is. sure a lot of people know that that's available. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if it were, if the community sort of did it, obviously it's not going to be for everybody, but right. if enough people did it, could that sh you know, sort of shift, you know, reduce the overall cost to the company to provide electricity? Um, it, it, will reduce the, um, it will reduce the load. Here's the double-edged sword, right? Every time you reduce the load, you reduce the income. Yep. And, and so, um, yes, that's great. You could, but that doesn't do anything to the operating side of the business. So it really is that balance between the two. I mean, you're still using the same amount of power. It's just when you're using it. Well, it, but that changes, right, but that does actually change the cost, so don't, right? Don't you buy on the uh, spot market for the midday surges? Uh, or, I'm not or, sure. Or not? We do buy on the spot market. That's more I can't, I can't speak to power, exactly right? when, yeah. you know, the, the that. So that would save you money to buy. avoid having to buy power that time. Yeah, right? it's, yeah. you know, it's way more complex than we would want to talk about tonight. Yeah, yeah. Um, I understand. And it has layers and layers, and I would be happy to come yeah. in, and it just yeah. helps me learn more. Yeah. But the dilemma, going back to the budget, is this double-edged sword, right? As you reduce and suppress use of electricity, you sell less electricity, your fixed costs remain the same. How do you continue to run the entity? It's like water. Exactly. We have it's the same problem here with water and sewer and... Yeah. Yeah. It's not an easy... Counterintuitive. Yeah. It doesn't make... It would not make any sense unless it was a regulated market mm -hmm. and, right. and a crazy regulated market at that. Um, two, a couple other things sure. real quick, Mr. Sure. Chair, if I may. Yep. Um, there's an organizational study that was completed and a reliability study. Those are designed to help the general manager and staff determine whether or not the organization is structured right with the right staff, doing the right with the right skill sets. Um, that report was given to the commission. Um, the CAB got a very uh, brief slide presentation and has asked for copies of those reports so we can have a more detailed understanding of exactly what the recommendations are, um, both on the reliability side and on the organizational side. And then, um, really, the only other thing I was going to mention, uh, sore subject for some, but I think the board should know if they're unaware of it, um, the truck sale, the capital equipment sale, um, was uh, executed for $26,000. So we've, oh, we've made a little good. bit of money on those. Right. Right. Yep. Any other questions? David, any, uh, a few years ago there was a discussion about the renewable energy credits. Where's, where's that been the last couple of cycles? The solar recs? Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, I don't think that Mark Tom could actually speak to that probably better than I can. I don't think that the market is really settled. So uh, the recs uh, that we've had uh, built up over the last few years, primarily hydro related, right. renewable energy credits, and and those that we purchased through the Green Choice program. So those are you know we're always getting new ones and they're cycling through as the way we have over the past few years. So every quarter or every year we uh, sell those. And so we're not absorbing or retiring them, or just no. the fraction due to the Green Choice program, I suppose. Yeah. So I'm, we're, I'm sorry. We're, pri we're primarily selling them. Right? So we yeah. Some that get retired, but yeah. most of them are sold. And yeah. I'm sorry, I misunderstood your question. The, uh, All right. There's another set of recs that are out there that are being discussed, which are the solar recs, which have to do with specifically with photovoltaic, and, right. and that's a market that we're not okay. quite sure about yet. Uh, final question, maybe from the board. Right. Any. Uh, I have a question of you. How can we help uh, the CAB and you specifically do your job? Um, uh, you know, the, the are we, that's are we meeting great, most frequently enough. You think? Well, I, I think um, I think the flow of information is great. I, okay. um, I think if we can continue to do that through the CAB, the most if, as an individual, the most uh, important thing for me because I can selfishly represent just Reading. Yes, um, <laughs> that's my job. Um, and so uh, the more I can understand about what this board wants and what the community wants the more I can advocate specifically for Reading, um, as opposed to the burden exactly. the commissioners share, which is to represent all of the ratepayers. Right. So the more I know, the better I can do the job for you. Keep the lights on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and by the way, right. they did a great job this winter. 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, my reliability is continues to be outstanding. Yeah. They're making a it's big investment and making it yeah. even better. And so I've I, been I watching them out in the trees. They are. Yeah. I see you have a new uh, arborist. Yeah, a new company. tree cutting yep. program. It's yeah. it's actually yielding some pretty positive results. It's Good. silly little things like that can make a big difference. <laughs> right? do. Yeah. Thank, thank you very much, much. Okay. Mr. Thank Tell. You. Thank you too. Thank okay. you, David. Have a great night. Okay. Next on the agenda, solar opportunities. I guess that would be Gene and Jesse. And anyone else uh, on the team going to speak? Could you please introduce yourself? Yeah, yeah Tom Miller also. Okay. We have Hello Tom again. again. Hello again. Hello. <laughs> so this um, conversation is a follow-up from a few weeks ago. If you recall, we had a member from the Climate Advisory Committee sort of introduce the idea mm -hmm. about uh, community-shared solar. So Tom is here. He's with RMLB. to think about this opportunity, and I'm just gonna give it to Tom to sort of go into a little bit more detail and how we can move forward on a project like this. Thank you, Jesse. Uh, my name is Tom Olala. I, my title is Integrated Resource Engineer at uh, RMLD. I'm uh, relatively new there, especially by RMLD standards. I've been <laughs> just hitting my first year anniversary now where the typical folks are 20, 30 year people. So. It's very exciting, there's a lot going on. As Dave mentioned earlier, there's a number of initiatives that we're starting, um, taking on. So that's exciting but challenging with a small organization. So it's, uh, it's definitely uh, in the positive direction to keep our reliability up and keep our rates from rising more than, than they have to. There's a lot of pressures from the external market and the external world um, that are, are really pushing that the envelope on uh, cost, uh, et cetera. So uh, there's a number of programs going on. I could spend all night talking about all of them, but I want to focus tonight on uh, a new concept that we're just exploring now. This uh, program is not available. It's called Community Shared Solar. So tonight I want to focus on explaining what that is and what it could possibly do for RMLD, for the town of Reading, and for all of our, uh, our customers. Um, the uh, current status of the program is we put together an ad hoc team, a multidisciplinary team. Uh, I represent RMLD. We have a number of folks from the uh, Reading Climate Advisory Committee. Uh, we have uh, some citizens from North Reading as well as from the, the Town of Reading office. Jesse and, and Bob has, has helped out in on a few meetings. So, uh, we're really exploring the options on what, uh, what this program could do for, for all of us. So with that, I can uh, go through the presentation. Um, just the, uh, the main image you see here is an artist rendering of um, uh, the, our primary uh, proposed site on where this uh, array could be is at Reading High School. So this is what it could look like if we constructed this project at Reading High School with a combination of rooftop solar as well as solar canopy or carport type. And that's what you see on the right here. That that's the, the main those picture. Those are actually here. panels that are built out over the existing park. Correct. Park so, yeah, it's essentially putting a, a small uh, roof section over uh, the, the parking area. So I'll get into that, but I just want to explain where that picture came from. So uh, what is uh, community shared solar? It's really a, a win-win par partnership between four entities, a private developer, municipal utility, the town, and the end users. Everybody wins some benefit out of this program. It's, it's a rare opportunity that uh, everyone gets a, a little piece of the pie, and, and it's something that we're very excited about. It's a concept that's uh, been uh, around for uh, several years in other parts of the country. It's still relatively new in Massachusetts and New England, but uh, it's something that the RMLD feels uh, is, is a positive thing. So we're exploring it. Again, it's not available right now, but we're putting together the nuts and bolts on how the program could work, specifically what the costs would be and what the benefits and how it would work. So let me go through just the basics on that. Um, uh, the uh, uh, the key advantage and why a it's advantageous for us to have a private developer involved in the process is that they could c 
capture the substantial federal and state tax incentives and depreciation benefits that we as municipals couldn't, cannot appreciate. Uh, when a private developer uh, invests capital to buy a large solar system, they get 30% off the top that the feds pay for in an investment tax credit. That um, situation ends at the end of uh, next year, 2016. So you're, you're, that's one of the reasons why you're seeing so much solar development going on in, in Massachusetts and around the country right now and, and into next year. So um, it's also one reason why you know, sort of time is of the essence. The more we can take advantage of this this year and next year, the better off we would be. So let me understand. That's a one-time credit the developer gets. It's not amortized over some It's period. up front. It's up front a 30% okay. tax credit. So you have to have a, you have to be a for-profit entity to take the credit Got against. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Massachusetts DOER, Department of Energy Resources, has developed this uh, community shared uh, concept as uh, one of their primary means to help accelerate the development uh, and deployment of solar to the approximately 80% of the population don't have a, uh, a roof that's adequate to put solar panels on their own home. Either they're renters or they have a house but it's shaded. So it just doesn't make a lot of sense to cull your trees down so you can uh, benefit from solar. It's not all that green on the, on the overall. So um, the, uh, DOER has been very supportive of this and we're working closely with them to roll out the plan. Um, how would it work? Um, it's uh, a lot of moving parts with you know four or five different entities involved, but everybody really has some benefit to it and, and plays an important role. The, uh, the CSS vendor or the private developer who's uh, you know, a, a major part of the core of the system, they come up with the financing for the project. So they have either finance capital resources of their own or they have partners to do that. They coordinate the engineering, design, procurement, construction, owning and operating of the system. So it's not RMLD that's buying the system and you know that we have to hire people to run the plan and do all this. That's coord we're, we, we supervise it and we write the spec and we make sure it's doing what they say, but the, the vendor, the developer, builds and operates the system. RMLD over, oversees the system specs and makes sure it, it's uh, coordinated with the grid. Um, we also help on the marketing side to s uh, sell the uh, solar shares, if you will, to the end users, the customers, whether they're commercial or residential uh, entities, or in this case, it could be town buildings. That um, if we put it at the high school, the high school could certainly uh, acquire a fair amount of their own load from this array. Um, the, uh, Can I the, ask you a question? Sure. Um, so I'm assuming that the, the front end company, the for profit company, right. manages the, the maintenance and the repair and you know an ongoing replacement as necessary. Is that right? Correct. And so how do they bond themselves? Um, that would be uh, built into the into the system. You know the program cost. You know it's these are typically 15 or 20 year programs, so those uh, operation and maintenance uh, <coughs> expenses get get factored into it. Well, so so the, I guess the question I have is that you know we've seen a lot of energy you know energy companies not yeah. make it. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so when these things go up, I mean I have, I love the concept. Once they're up, they're up. Right. And so, is there a what, what, one cons on one concept that we could incorporate into that is that because RMLD is a partner into it, we could act act as a backstop to them. That if worst case they went out of business, we could uh, take title to the equipment and manage mm -hmm. the system from that point on. We wouldn't so lose the credits in retrospectively, would we? Would, that? would we lose the credits that we got up that the developer no, the, got up front? No, the S rec credits would still go to whoever took title of, of the. Uh, and that's a done deal, uh, ir irrespective of whether or not the company survives. I, I believe that uh, Sandra is with uh, Blue Wave Capital, who's been uh, advising us on the program. Yeah, and I'm, I'm happy to respond. So typically, how these contracts work out is that there is a bounding um, collateral uh, that's associated with it. 
I'm not the best at speaking to that, but um, it provides for the long-term operation and maintenance of the facility as well as decommissioning once the facility has used um, reached its end of life, which is typically somewhere between 20, 30, 40 years, right. um, depending on the facility and what the appetite is for the community that we're working with at that point. Um, these, these would all be specified at a later date in net metering credit purchase agreement or power purchase agreement that we would execute with PRMLD, but it is a, a common component. Uh, you're going to put these potentially on the rooftops of municipal buildings. Uh, those roofs typically are replaced every 10, 15, 20 years. How does that work as part of this deal? Who, who is responsible for doing that? Uh, how do you do it underneath a solar array? Yeah. It, it so typically, there's a lot of vetting that goes on with regards to um, where we'll put solar in advance of us actually installing the system. For a rooftop solar system, we'll take, first take a look at the age of the roof as well as the mm -hmm. overall roof quality. Um, and you know, if it's a reasonable roof, we'll work with an independent consultant to ass provide assurance that it's both structurally sound and the quality of the roof is sufficient to last the 20 year lifespan of the solar PV mm -hmm. system. Um, that, so that's one step that we go through. Now, if there are marginal roofs that we are interested in pursuing, we can discuss an accelerated roof replacement, but those are conversations that we would have you know, once we actually evaluate the rooftop. The rooftop that we're looking at, principally at the, more, at the high school, um, is of the field house, which I understand is of good quality and was recently replaced. Okay. So it's not the main high school roof. Oh, okay. That's a misunderstanding on my part. Go ahead. Uh, just to clarify one thing, this, this is a very complex issue. Yep. Lots of moving parts of it, but lots of pieces. Respectfully, when Reading gets involved in an issue like this, we don't particularly care how the market operates. Um, we've done that many times in finance. We've told the market how it should operate. So we'll study all the moving pieces, figure out who has what advantages. You know, the tax credits are a natural uh, advantage. If our cost of carry is an advantage, we'll use that. We'll figure something out. Mm -hmm. But even if there's a traditional path that take people go down, that may be the right path, but we'll make a lot of effort to really study it and understand it. And um, Jane uh, Parenko at the Light Department fully understands, you know, working together and understanding. There's three people that have to end up being satisfied at the end of the day, yeah. pretty much equal. Who does the structural uh, c computations to make sure the roof can bear the load? Facility, then, if we need to, we a would do that. Engineer, then. Okay, all right. Um, so the electricity that gets produced from this, do we have the ability, or is our do we have the ability to sell it to other people, or not just our users? Because Otherwise, we're cre just creating the same problem we had when Dave was yeah, talking yeah. about. We're creating electricity. But maybe during peak hours. <laughs> right. We're creating electricity that we can't sell. Uh, that, yeah. that basically, you know, we're, we're adding to fixed cost, and yet, um, you know, we're using less electricity. So how, you know, the, the electricity that gets produced, can we, is that a commodity <coughs> for it, RMLD really to use at its own discretion? It's really become a compromise that we have longer term goals set by our commissioners that they want you know, they're advocating a larger percentage of green and renewable uh, power sources in our portfolio. So this is a way where we can do that and still minimize the cost or the premium. So the bottom line is you're right, that what we <coughs> will end up paying for the, the electrons that come out of this system is gonna be a little bit higher than what we can buy from Quebec Hydro or whoever we're buying it from now. But it's a, it's a reasonable compromise, so it's, you know, it's certainly doable, and what, as long as it's a relatively small percentage of our overall portfolio, it's not really a, a major issue. What's the disparity in the cost per kilowatt hour between solar and standard uh, you know, gas-generated, uh, nuclear-generated? Now, is it three to one, two to one? Well, I, I mean, it, it's, it's quite a range depending on the specific project, but as an example, we have uh, private developers that are putting in solar, uh, systems in our territory now on say commercial buildings and we, we've uh, agreed to sign power purchase agreements that we're buying the power from them mm -hmm. for seven or eight cents a kilowatt hour hmm. but if you look at our overall portfolio that Jane manages yep. our average wholesale cost is five or six cents so that's the premium that that's all it is getting right now. So oh. it's not double, but yeah. it is, you know, it is higher. That's so the more solar we put in our portfolio, our average cost does t 
tend to go Sounds up. like there's been a hell of an increase in efficiency because I can yeah, the, being uh, much, the, much the much hardware's better. been yeah. getting better, the prices have been coming down, so it's all positive, but it's it's still not, you know, a no brainer cheaper than what you're doing now. Yeah. Bob, there was an article this week in the Wall Street Journal on this very topic. Bob touched on it. There's so many moving parts, including subsidies for the operating yeah. side, that if you strip those away, it's closer to two or three to one. Yeah. If you throw them back mm -hmm. in, you get that's the how you get closer to one. Guests mentioned tonight. But I have two other concerns. I love the idea of money from the sky. This is the closest uh, you'll get to that. But if we want to buy hydroelectric power, we generally don't erect a dam. If we want windmill power, we generally don't erect a windmill. You can buy shares in companies that usually are located in areas that have more sunlight or a better angle of inclination to the sun. And we might look at that. This gets us into the operating side, which is different than anything else we do. This is actually in the manufacturing side of energy. So you've got the disposal, you've got the long term operations and maintenance. Decommissioning potential. And if, tax, yeah, if all the moving the parts change five years from now, you're committed, right? So that, that's true, but, but that is all funded and capitalized by the private developer that gets paid for out of these existing credits. So. So you're right. If you took the credits away, it wouldn't it wouldn't be Doesn't feasible. Work. But it, it's important to know that note that it's not uh, two million dollars that RMLD or the town has to raise. It's through the developer, and it's 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 spread out over the ten, the 15 or 20 years that there's enough you know incentive that the developer make their investors make money, and and we uh, you know make money as well. So it's it's certainly a very attractive thing that I think it's in our best interest to you know, take advantage of while we can. i make a slightly different point. Could you make, invest in a facility elsewhere in Massachusetts or elsewhere in the country and get all the same attendant benefits? No, it has to be in your service territory. You can't buy solar power from Arizona and have it shipped here. That It's just not, not shipped. It's, it's not an option. option. Well, even, even virtual net metering, which is what this system is, it has to be within the load zone, the territory where you are. Okay. So National Grid, they're required by law to do net metering, but it has to be within their territory. Yes, Dave. Just, uh, Dave just, Tal, just, yep. just one quick um, uh, elaboration on the point that uh, Mr. Arena was making, is that any power you buy from somewhere else, you're paying a transmission cost, in addition to the cost Perfect. of the electricity. Any power you generate within the district, you don't pay any and those, <coughs> those costs are going to go way up. <laughs> so it's oh, yeah. just the cost of, 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 of having it carriage over the transmission system. So that it, that's why it's better to be local. Energy. In fact, those charges are, are the ones that are going up most significantly as a percentage of our cost, the transmission mm -hmm. and the capacity fees. They're really, over the next three years, are going to go up significantly. So we're, that's why we're putting things in place to, to mitigate that. Solar is one, distributed generation is another, uh, load shedding programs with our, our commercial customers to work with them to cut back on load, to minimize those peaks. So, so we're doing, you know, it's a multifaceted approach. It's, it's not all, all our eggs in one basket. But, you know, this is, you know, I'm, I'm urging everyone to consider this, that it's a, it's a good deal for RMLD, it's a good deal for the town, it's a good deal for the, uh, the, the rate payers. Yeah, I want to just hold questions and let you get through yep. your presentation because we're coming up on the witching right. hour. My ten minutes are almost up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you continue? Okay. Um, so I think we we made it through uh, how it works. How does it benefit everybody? The town of Reading, um, as as a uh, payment for uh, allowing us the system to use the, uh, the site, whether it's the, the high school or a town building, there would be some type of lease payment as part of the project, mm -hmm. as well as usually there's some form of pilot payment or uh, payment in lieu of taxes. So, so that's a, a positive economic advantage for the town. Um, there's also the potential that uh, the uh, expenses at the high school, for example, if they participate in the program, some percentage of their power would be, be coming from the system, so that could uh, reduce the, uh, their monthly electric bill based on that, depending on the perfor overall performance of the system. The same way, uh, cus and customers who signed up for the program could benefit by lower monthly bills you know, um, on the system. And 
One of the big advantages of solar is it's a long-term hedge against rising prices. We've all been talking about electric rates in general are, are on a slope like this going up 2, 3, 5% a year. Solar, it's definitely proven that these, uh, this hardware can last easily 15, 20, 30 years. And the, the fuel, if you will, is not going up. So it, once that equipment is paid for, you can count on whatever that that's, uh, charge is. Even if it's a premium right now at, at eight or nine cents, you know, five or 10 years from now, that's gonna be a discount. So there's gonna be a crossing here. So it's a longer term hedge against rising prices. So that's a good reason to invest in you know, many forms of solar. Would you go into that in depth in a pro forma once you get to that point? Yes, yeah. exactly. And, and uh, you know, a big part of my presentation today is to give you a status Got on it. where we're yeah. at. So a, a big part of our effort right now is working with Blue Wave and the town and others to put together a very detailed financial model to, that fleshes this out that says, okay, you know, enough of your generalities, Tom, you know, exactly how much is this going to cost exactly. the town, how much is it going to uh, affect my bill. So we'll have a, th that information within the next month or so. So that, that's sort of where we are. And, you know, we're going to learn from other systems and other places in the country that have done this, as well as, you know, how is it different here. It's a little bit uh, breaking new ground that there isn't another municipal in the state that, have, that has done a community solar program yet, so we're, we're breaking new ground. But I, I, to me, I think that's exciting that the, the board and the organization is willing to support, you know, out-of-the-box thinking like that. So it's, it's refreshing. It's good. Um, for uh, RMLD, uh, or, or for the RMLD customers, and uh, this first phase of the program is working with Reading, and uh, we'll, this uh, array will be sited at a municipal, municipal site here within Reading, but it's available to RMLD customers in any of the towns. So if you live in Wilmington or Linfield, you could, once the, the program is up and running, you could sign up to participate. And once we have the system here and we learn what's good and bad about it, we can replicate that model in the other towns. So the, our longer term goal is to have a, an array like this, at least one in each of the four service towns. Um, okay, could you take about two minutes and yeah. wrap up? We're really getting a little behind up here. Okay. Uh, the, the status is we've evaluated um, I think originally we had a list of 10 or 12 sites, but we recently narrowed that down to three potential sites. And uh, last week, we really narrowed that down to one choice, that our, our by far uh, suggested site is at the Reading High School, which you can see here. So it's a combination of uh, solar panels on the rooftop of the field house, as well as the uh, solar canopy systems in the three parking lots. So if we built out all of the, those as proposed, it would be a little bit over one megawatt worth of capacity. And to give you a frame of reference, if the high school chose to participate in the program and use 20% of that output, there would be enough power left over to completely power 120 homes. Or if you only want to do half of the power, it could be 240 homes uh, and, and so forth. So that's um, during times when the sun's shining. No, that, that's, no, that's that's average consistent. average over the course of the year. Oh, okay. So that that's in kilowatt hours produced by a solar array over the course of the year. So each kilowatt of uh, capacity generates 120, uh, 1,200 kilowatt hours over a year. Right. Typical household uses about 10,000 yep. kilowatt hours per year. So each kilowatt can generate roughly 10% of the power that you're using, energy you're using in, in your home for the whole year. So it, it's a good chunk. It's certainly small compared to the total load on, the, the peak load of the whole RMLD system is around 160 megawatts. So this is one, so it's a small piece, but it is you know uh, definitely contributing in a real way. Next, next steps in po uh, policy issues, as I mentioned, what we're doing primarily right now is, is detailing the financial uh, plan, um, doing the uh, initial system engineering. We have to do a finer uh, level of detail to get the, the true cost. We have to work with the town folks to 
understand what a lease and pilot payment would look like. Um, and we have to develop a specific net metering policy that would handle, handle the logistics of how we would get customers to sign up, how we would pay them, how would their bill change, and, and those type of impacts. Um, and then, as I mentioned, after this first system is deployed in Reading, we would uh, look at deploying that same model in the other towns. The 30% tax credit I mentioned does expire at the end of next year, so uh, we got to make hay while the sun shines. And while that's still there, it's possible that could be extended, but the way things are in Washington these days, who knows? Um, uh, and then one last point I would, would want to make is um, there is a uh, uh, engineering and uh, logistical limit on how much solar we can have in the territory. And right now, our tentative cap on that is 6% of our overall, lo overall load. So the 160 megawatts I mentioned, if you take 6% of that, it works out to about 10 megawatts. So the system I showed at Reading, we really could do 10 of those before it would start to get to a point where we have to look at, you know, more engineering or you know, what are the impacts of having too much solar because, because of the fact that it's intermittent. You have to make right. sure that it doesn't you know, make your system unstable or do any uh, negative things. Right. Uh, qu question on procurement process. Is this, what is the process for selecting a vendor? Is this well, sole that, source? Or that actually is, is yeah. part of the, the next steps that we're doing <coughs> is to understand the, uh, the, the procurement um, issues. Yeah. Uh, Blue Wave Capital was selected through a partnership between the town and MAPC, Metropolitan right. Area Planning Commission. So, you know, they're doing some preliminary work with us, but something this big, I, my gut feel is we have to have some type of RFP or, yep. or yep. prices from other folks. Um, but that's where we have to, you know, really work out those details. But it's, it's confusing because we're not really spending two million dollars it's it's really just agreeing to the, the contractual terms of this. Well I mean there's nothing for nothing. Yeah, right. there, there is a trade off. Right. But because we're not in the business of we're responsible for credits. performance. And you, and we there is a company yeah. that is right. so right. you know right. as you point out there are you know there's benefits to all parties. Right. And that's clear. Um, but you know it seems to me that although the timeline may be short, we are at this point a long way from being able to see the financials it sounds like. I mean the financials no that that's not true within the next month we'll have the so financial these financials do they come out essentially in a cookie cutter fashion in other words we do this this is the way we always do it every community that's been recommended by MAPC mm -hmm. to blue wave I mean it, it's how not does that work it's not cookie cutter because it's a relatively new concept so uh, and especially as a municipal it, it's a new approach but but that's what we're putting together now and uh, within the next month or so, we'll have the, some real numbers to look at, you know, in detail with Bob and his team and say, okay, does this make sense? And do we go to the next step or, you know, go back to... Well, that's probably, uh, that's guess what I'm saying is that's the place that the negotiation is. Yeah. yeah. Um, because there is, there's a lot going on here. Right. I mean, it, it is in a simplistic way, and, and I actually endorse the fact that we're going down this path to explore right. it. I think it's very wise that we do it. But well, thank it, you. Much I appreciate more. that because you know it is out of the norm, so we want to make sure we're you know, doing things that make sense for all of us. Hopefully, we've asked the right questions tonight. And uh, Tom, thank you for your briefing. Thank, okay. thank, thank everybody you. who's thank been working on this. Okay, I'm going to ask uh, the indulgence of the Climate Advisory Committee. Are you folks planning to stay through for the 9:30 agenda no. item, or, or not? Not all of you. You want to go? Why don't we go forward with your report then? Dave Williams and Gina Snyder, right? And, and Who else? Ron. Of course, Ron and Darren. Yeah, have a seat. Not too many weeks ago. Okay. okay. Can we cover this in about 10 minutes, I think? Yeah. Do, do your best. Okay, thank you. We're running a little long, but that's okay. This is an update, but it's also a matter of uh, renewal of our... 
How, how much time do you need? What do you, what do you think? Ten. Ten, ten is good? Okay. I don't want to cut you short. Mm -hmm. So it's an update and also the rep for the renewal and the, we don't want to yeah. 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 sunset. Okay. <laughs> this gives us the members and um, Joan associate member, but very important to us. This is a mission statement, kind of wordy, but we have been adhering to it as a town advisory committee, volunteers looking at ec environmental, economic, and societal sustainability, and you know, trying to reduce energy and energy costs and foster environmental stewardship. So we've been working on that for probably uh, 10 years, we'd say. Um, about two weeks ago, we talked about the paper <coughs> and cardboard recycling uh, to this uh, board, and uh, that is in, still in process. We appreciate your support of that, with JRM, JRM hauling, providing the uh, dumpster for that free, and we as a climate committee will continue to monitor this, pro this project. You've also been hearing a lot about the shared solar system. We certainly don't need to do much about that at this point because you've heard the last half hour. Uh, we look at this as a uh, extension of this local energy action program which we were involved with for quite a while. And we look at it that would probably replace the green choice program with a visible clean renewable energy product that you can see, everybody can see in Reading, see what they're buying and see what it's doing, uh, which was not true of the uh, Green Choice program. So we're looking at, at that end of it <coughs> in terms of the sale to the customer. And uh, so another thing which we've been doing very recently has been the um, Earth Day Fair a couple of weeks ago, and you can see, okay, this doesn't show that, but yes it does, okay. Uh, we had several tables at the RMLD, and we're very appreciative to the work that the RMLD has done with us in providing a person on our committee, and also uh, supplying the, a lot of the resources for our uh, activities, and that certainly the, uh, that was one of them. Here is one of our members, uh, Ray Porter, who has uh, a lot of environmental expertise and is uh, involved with uh, geothermal in his own home. And mm -hmm. then we had a display of electric cars. So that's one of our activities. <coughs> a lot of social outreach, here we have Ron Diodario and uh, myself and Gina also were at the um, chemistry at the high school. Uh, five course, five classes of chemistry students in one day. Ron did a book report at the library and Gina has been very involved with the Green Sense articles uh, which occur <coughs> weekly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just, one very yeah, quick thing. Go right ahead. The book, The Sixth Extinction, by Elizabeth Colbert. Partly, I'm not saying we take any credit on this, but uh, just today was awarded the Pulitzer for nonfiction. Oh. So, <coughs> wow. <Okay. No. laughs> I, I don't think we should take too much credit. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not looking not. for too much credit. Maybe three much. <laughs> so, upcoming. We're looking to work with the um, RMLD and continuing and uh, with the schools and on the shared community uh, solar concept. We also have <coughs> recently adopted an island. It's a rather big island, but uh, very visible near the train station. And we're looking at possible activities with the uh, uh, Council on Aging for a Seniors Energy Efficiency Program, which would involve a lot of installation and the simple things that can be done. 
and continuing with the schools, churches, and libraries, and newspapers. So, would you want to add anything to that in a couple minutes? Any questions? Thank you. Uh, questions, questions from the board? So we look forward to continuing. Just so you know, we're, we're going to discuss the idea of, the, of sunsetting or not tonight, yes. but we're not going to actually vote until our next meeting. So this is a good opportunity to uh, state your case. Well, bring, bring all the evidence before us for continuing. Yeah. And I think you've, you've got, gotten off to a good start, I'd say. So we'll continue that discussion uh, later in the evening. Okay. Yeah. Once you. again, any questions? No. 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 Thank, thank you, Dave. Good job. Always. Thank, thank you for coming in. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Stick around. Okay, uh, Walk Reading weekend. We have uh, the Blodgetts are here. Any, anyone else from your group? Oh, we uh, have several others here. Oh, great. <laughs> well, I, I will uh, we'll make it quick. <laughs> let, me, let me read the proclamation oh, okay. and you can uh, amplify on it. This is a proclamation for Walk Reading weekend. Whereas re research shows that one in two men and one in three women are at risk for heart disease with poor lifestyle as a major contributor, and whereas. Adults may gain up to two hours of life expectancy for every hour of regular, vigorous exercise. And whereas regular exercise has many proven benefits for an individual's overall health in addition to increased life expectancy. And whereas walking, running, and bicycling are all excellent forms of exercise that are accessible to most of our citizens, that help the environment by reducing the use of motorized transport, and that allow our citizens to appreciate and learn about our neighborhoods and the open spaces in our community. And whereas the Reading Trails Committee, the Reading Open Land Trust, and Walkable Reading encourage all Reading residents to participate in Walk Reading Weekend on Saturday, May 30th and 31st, 2015, by getting outside and taking a walk, bike, hike, or run. Now, therefore, we, the selectmen of the town of Reading, in recognition of the importance of regular physical activity to promote individual and community health and to reduce greenhouse emission do hereby proclaim May 30th and May 31st, 2015 as Walk Reading Weekend and urge all citizens to show their support for this effort by walking, biking, running, or hiking here in town on at least one of those days. So would you like to add to that? Uh, just a little bit. We um, sure. actually have this going to pass out. We have our red ribbons on. Kevin's already. I don't expect him to take a walk that weekend with his tie on, but he's got some red. Thank you. Um, we just, as a way of um, letting other people know that you're out there walking and remind them that it's Walk Reading Weekend, that's why we suggested that everybody put on something red just so that people will say, oh yeah. A um, couple of important things. We have four organized walks that we've set up. Uh, there are going to be two on Saturday and two on Sunday. Saturday there'll be a walk at the Pinevale Conservation Area. Uh, Saturday at 1, there'll be a town forest hike meeting at Wood End. Um, Sunday, there will be, uh, Dave Williams is going to do one of his bird walks up at the town forest. Uh, That's a different day at Williams, it's right? River. That's on <laughs> Sunday. Yeah. Okay. And then on Sunday at 1 o'clock, we're going to do a, a walk and historic house tour. Start at Parker Tavern, head up, probably up Woburn Street to Summer and back down Prescott and see if we can hit a few highlights. And so there's a variety of things that people can join in, but mostly we want people to just get out and walk a bike or ride. You know, we have, right. if you go on the town website, all the um, mm -hmm. conservation area, all the trail maps are online, uh, neighborhood walks are online, mm -hmm. on the library website you can get to Walkable Reading's, Reading's um, pod tour of historic houses, which would be great for a bike ride. So, um, you know, that last year we had people call in uh, or write in or email into mm -hmm. either trails or Walkable Reading and we totaled up the miles. We made it to Reading, Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> this year we're aiming for Reading, California. So, you know, I think we can do it. That's so. spelled different. All right. That's so right. so that's all, that's those, all the times, locations, and everything for the 30th and 31st are on the website. They are. There's a so whole Walk Reading on. page on okay. the town website. We're, we're Either can access it through trails or through Walkable Reading's page on there. Okay. Um, and then we're going to have posters and things up all around Any town. It'll print be in publicity the paper. in the Chronicle? Yep. Yes. Okay, Chronicle good. and the Advocate. Excellent. There will be articles, and it's been in the YCC. and. Uh, in the Reading Rec magazine, so I think we've kind of covered a lot of the bases. There'll be a lot of flyers up all around at the conservation trailheads and so on mm -hmm. and so forth. So, kind of get everybody out there. So, good hopefully, work. good weather. Oh, but <laughs> all right, yes, thank hopefully. you. Okay, would you like to read <laughs> yeah. the motion? You can for walk the, in the rain. Yeah, don't go away. <laughs> Move to proclaim uh, Walk Reading Weekend on Saturday, May 30th, and Sunday, May 31st. Okay. Okay. Uh, any further discussion? All in favor? And we'd like to present you with this proclamation. 
take up the uh, continued hearing on the liquor license transfer for uh, Grumpy Doyle's. We don't need to read the notice again. It will just reopen okay. the, uh, the hearing that was continued. Uh, so representatives want to come up. Uh, perhaps you reintroduce yourselves for the uh, viewing public. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, Attorney Trish Farnsworth. With me, Henry Carrasu, the uh, proposed manager of um, Unagi, which is seeking to purchase Grumpy Doyle's and transfer of the license. And we're here, the issue came up uh, two weeks ago. Yes. Uh, I believe we addressed it with uh, Lieutenant Abadi. And uh, you should have that in front of you. We do. Yes. I don't know if there's any more questions on that. We didn't really delve into right. um, you know, the restaurant, proposed restaurant, and things of that nature. Okay. Other questions from the board? Uh, we received some supplemental information from the police uh, indicating that uh, they had no objection to moving forward. Has everybody had a chance to review that? Yes. yes. Okay. A any uh, questions from the public? Uh, this is a public hearing. Questions, comments? Any further questions from the board? Are uh, we ready to close the hearing? I'll accept the motion. I just like to make that okay, comment, sure. just so that we're clear. We're very happy that you know we haven't been revitalized business, but that business is going to continue. And I think it's important that you understand that our questions two weeks ago were simply a function of clarification. I mean, we've got responsibilities in a variety of areas, and one of them is a very serious responsibility, and that is managing the liquor license. And so for us, it was very important Restated uh, clarity that you provided to us, and look forward to what's going on in, in the new business. Very good. All right, is there a motion to close the hearing if there's no further comment? Okay. So, thank you. Uh, move to approve a transfer. Well, let's close the hearing. Now. Excuse the hearing. First. And motion to uh, close the hearing on a liquor license, on a liquor license transfer. transfer for Grumpy Dolls. That's all. Grumpy Dolls. Okay, is that seconded? Second. Second. Uh, discussion? All in favor? Okay, the hearing is hereby closed, 5-0. Secretary? Move to approve the transfer of a restaurant, all, li all alcohol liquor license to Unagi Service, Inc., doing business as Biltmore Main Bar and Grill at 530 Main Street, for term expiring December 31st, 2015, subject to the following Ooh. conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Second to that? Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? The vote is 5-0. The license is approved. Thank Good luck Thank to you. Good luck. Thank you very much. Thank you guys just kicking me towers at the moment. Is that what you all last year. <laughs> it's a little random. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say sun, sunspots. That's my fallback. Anyway, uh, we have another continued hearing uh, for a new liquor license for Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza, 48 Walkersburg Drive. Are those proponents here? Yeah. Thank you. I'll reopen the hearing at this time. It was uh, continued at our last meeting. And, uh, I'm Caroline Powell, attorney for Anthony's, and with me is um, Cody Foote, who's a proposed manager. Okay. Um, so I thought I'd just kind of give you a little bit of background as to what Anthony's is, what they do, um, sure. what they like to do at 48 Wofford's Brook Drive. Anthony's is a uh, national chain of coal-fired pizza restaurants. They have approximately 50 locations, majority of which are in Florida, but they're also in New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Delaware, and in two weeks, Westwood, hopefully. Um, this will be the second location in Massachusetts. Their specialty is coal-fired pizzas, and it's a you know, family-friendly environment. Um, you know, most of the focus is on food and not alcohol, but they do like to serve you here in mind with meals. Um, actually, if you'd like to see a copy of the menu, I'm more than happy to share it with you, but it's you know, pretty standard you know, pizza, salad, um, the fish. Exactly. Um, the proposed location is 48 Walker Park Drive. It is going to be a complete rebuilding of that one half of the building, they're refitting the whole, um, 
the whole restaurant area for Anthony's. We're hoping to be open fourth quarter of this year, um, but you never know. Um, and it's going to be, there's going to be um, 97 seats. There is going to be a small outdoor patio that consists of four tables with 16 seats. And one of the things that Anthony's likes to do is it's called an indoor outdoor bar. So the bar, it makes a U-shaped, um, it's a U-shape, but there are about eight or 10 seats that are on the outside of the building. So in the summer season, people can sit at the bar and eat and yet still be outdoors, which is oh, yeah. kind of a nice little thing to do in New England where we can't be outdoors for very many months of the year. Um, and that's kind of the, the general description of what Anthony's is and what it's proposing to do at Walker's Brook Drive. Just to be clear, that's the side of the former macaroni grill. Mm -hmm. Correct. So Correct. for the viewing public. Correct. And that's being mm -hmm. split into, as I understand it, with Anthony's on one side and somebody else on the other. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we're only taking half of it. Bob, is there still a minimum seating requirement for a liquor license or did that go away? That, that went away. Okay. Very good. Questions from the board? We also received uh, the affidavit you sent in and I think that uh, the police have rendered their Clearance on that, they, they have no objection to moving okay. forward. Um, the one request I also would like to make in addition is I note that for your regulations that you need to have the um, premises open within 120 days of issuing the license. If construction mm -hmm. goes closer to the end of the year, yeah. I don't know that we're going to be guaranteed to be open in 120 days, so you, I just you ask can come for back and ask for a waiver. Yeah, to spend out that off place downtown that's yes. been done yet. <laughs> there you go. Overextended. Exactly. Right. Okay. okay uh, if there when does construction start? Um, that start date on that, I'm not 100% sure. We are just finishing up Westwood right now in Massachusetts. Also, a few other locations in Florida. So, a month, month and a half would be my best guess. It's, the lease was signed only you know, about three weeks ago. So, I think they're probably still looking at and preliminary planning and <coughs> permitting, et cetera. But I can get you a date as to when it, we think it might start. What would you estimate the build out to take? When, when do you expect to, as you sit here? They um, usually yeah. turn about five weeks, depending really? on everything that goes on. I mean, we're a pretty aggressive. A yeah. pretty simple chain. Our kitchens are very small. We don't have a freezer. Everything's fresh. Mm -hmm. So the hardest part is our coal fired oven to uh, build that. And that's pretty much tile in a bar. So. Great. Thank you. Questions? Any questions from the public? Okay, seeing no questions, I'll ask for a motion to close the hearing for the uh, new liquor license for Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza. Uh, move to close the public hearing for new liquor license for Anthony's Coal Fired Pizza. That's seconded. Second. Uh, all in favor? <coughs> Vote is 5 0. You are approved, and good luck to you. No, wait, that oh, we, we just closed the closed hearing. Oh, I closed the hearing. Move to <laughs> <approve>. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Move to approve a new restaurant on liquor license to Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza of Reading, LLC, doing business as Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza at 48 Walkers Brook Drive, for term expiring December 31st, 2015, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. All right, is that seconded? Discussion? Um, just one comment for the um, applicant. Um, you're relatively new to Reading, and by the way, welcome to, welcome to our, our town. We uh, really uh, are focused on the growth of our commercial segment, Walker's Brook Drive. That whole complex is uh, taking a long time, and it's nice to, to get built out. It's been there for several years, and it's to see uh, one of the vacancies they pull. Um, this board knows, you may not, but we put a high premium on compliance with our, um, our surveying clause. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. we really have a, a, a traditionally a very short fuse on uh, non-compliance. Um, uh, we have a strong focus in our high school in terms of uh, substance abuse, and we, we try to mirror that at the adult level with the way of the uh, licensing, how we look at uh, non-compliance with the licensing laws. So um, appreciate it if you keep it that way. It's the uh, it, so. We're planning on having everyone either 
SIPs are Serve Safe certified, and uh, Anthony's has an internal training program that focuses on, among other things, alcohol training for all of its employees. So they do take it very seriously. You know, people get dizzy and get distracted, and you know, there's all the normal reasons why things don't get done the way they're supposed to. We appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If there are any further comments from the board, all, all in favor? It's five zero, and now you are approved. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for your time. Okay, Thank much. You can leave a menu, by the way. Yeah. You like it? Yes, yeah, I have one, sure. sure. <laughs> well, we'll uh, They'll be ordering soon. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you order on, on, on the online eventually? Not nah, well, maybe. Not okay. <laughs> we'll see you guys on Westwood. Come down right now. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I saw their uh, Very good. Westwood pictures. Okay. It's beautiful. Okay, the time has come to discuss the uh, Lincoln Street 40B project. Uh, Gene, you want to sort of introduce? Real quick, I'm sorry, before, before you go, I just have to make one comment and bring uh, the board to awareness. Sure. So one of the investors, uh, Matthew Roman, uh, and myself went to high school together. Okay. We're friends right. through high school. Um, it's, it's one thing I, I have to, I haven't had a chance yet, I have to file with the clerk's office. Okay. A disclosure form stating that my company um, has no uh, direct uh, relation or, or it's not going to benefit in any way from, from uh, what this project is moving forward, either myself or anyone in my company. Thank you, Kevin. Um, so so you, you're going to stay in the form with that disclosure? I'm going to stay in the form with that disclosure. Uh, That's fine. Feeling is, uh, Matt, Matt and I were, are like most high school buddies where we saw each other the other day for the first time maybe in 22 years um, <laughs> from a communication standpoint as well. So. Um, well, while we were high school friends then, you know, it certainly doesn't judge uh, or impair my judgment at this point in time, but I wanted to Thank let you. everyone know I haven't had a chance to file with the clerk's office. I've just been a little bit busy, but I'm able to file that um, disclosure with the clerk's office. Very good. Okay, with that, uh, Gene, could you, you uh, lead things, things off or do you want to do it? Actually, I had a question yeah. before you yes. see. You do? Or they do. do. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the notice map that's included on tonight's, or at least the electronic handout. Yeah. Um, it's not do we customarily notice uh, businesses as well as? Yeah, anyone, okay, anybody, anyone within that, that address. Yeah. This is um, yeah. a little bit more notification than is customary. It just mm. seemed like a reasonable thing to do. Um, and if you look at the map, um, you know, a lot of property was on the other side of Washington yeah. Street. Mm -hmm. Right. We just did all addresses on Washington Street. It seemed like the reasonable thing to do. But I didn't see, at least in the yellowing map, I didn't see anything on the other side yeah. of High Street. Uh, no, that was the other side of the tracks was just deemed to be too far away, not immediately impacted. But if there were a business within this territory, they would have got the same numbers. Thank you. All right, everybody set? <laughs> okay. Do you want to leave things off? Sure. Um, they have a PowerPoint, so we're. All right. Pulling with that as we speak. Okay. So while she's pulling that up, do you want to introduce yourself to the audience, uh, sir? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Development team here. I'll give a quick introduction. Matt Zucker with New Meadow Development, MKM Reading, and I'm here tonight with uh, Ken Chase from New Meadow and Matt Roman from New Meadow, MKM Reading. Um, also Doug Carr from Cube Three Studios, our architect, and Jeff Angler from SEB uh, yeah. Consulting. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with the site at the corner of Lincoln and Prescott, the Duchette building and the Surly Wood. Uh, it's obviously a, uh, a building in the condition. We'll go through the PowerPoint to see the existing uh, photos. Um, just a quick update. Uh, we had a meeting last night with the neighbors. Uh, we invited the director butters. We had a good turnout. Um, I believe it was very productive. We heard uh, obviously some of the concerns and comments, uh, some specific to you know, the actual director butters and some more general uh, comments uh, that we've heard and that we'll continue to hear, and there are many of them are here tonight, so I'm sure they'll uh, address that. Um, we, you know, we really take a lot of pride in all the projects we do. Uh, we treat everyone with, try to be reasonable, respectful, and responsible. We spent a lot of time looking at this site and trying to come up with a vision and a design that we felt was a great transition between downtown, the train station, to this <coughs> kind of site that kind of didn't fit into the residential neighborhood and uh, put a lot of thought into how that was gonna look. Um, it's still in, you know, we're still making changes to that um, based on just our own internal review and also comments we heard last night from the neighbors. 
Um, there's other steps we haven't gone through yet. We you know, have hired our traffic consultant um, to start looking at some ideas that he has. Uh, so some of those details we don't have yet. Um, so we look forward to going through the process uh, with this board, with the zoning board, and continuing the meetings that we will uh, have in the future with the neighbors as well. So well, um, just for the public's knowledge, some of you sent in emails today. Uh, emails up to about 6, 6.30 are in the Board of Selectmen's packet tonight. Those that came after, just before 7, just got hand, handed out to them just before the meeting. So anything till about quarter or 7 they have, but if it's after that, they may not have seen it yet, just so you're aware. <coughs> Okay. Um, thank you, Mayor. As I, as I said, my name is Doug Carr. I'm a principal of Cube 3 Studio Architects. We're out of Lawrence, Massachusetts. Uh, we specialize in multifamily design. We have projects, we have several thousand units already built within the Greater Boston, and several thousand more on the boards and in the construction right now. And cities as diverse as Waltham, Watertown, Medford, Cambridge. Uh, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, I think everyone's familiar with the site. Obviously, it's direct, directly across the street from the, the uh, commuter rail station. It's a classic example of transit-oriented development, which is something that we're seeing more and more of, obviously, as time goes on, because uh, you want to get the density and the people as close as possible to the train station and obviously have them get out of their cars wherever possible. Um, there's a couple of existing, uh, there's an aerial photo in the middle that shows the uh, outline of the property, the two existing buildings that are on the property, the, the four-story building here on Prescott Street. And then there's a three and a one story building here on Lincoln Street. And these are just some of the views that are um, showing you from around the various sites. Uh, looking, the, the one in the bottom right is looking down Prescott Street south. The building is outlined in red. And the other one, uh, I guess Lincoln Street up in the upper left hand corner, is looking towards it uh, from this side as well. And the, and the Brown's auto repair is accepted from this side? Yes. Oh. Yes, he's not yes. part of it. Right. Yes, the Brown's auto is not a part of it. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah, so this, this is their auto repair, which is not part of this site. It's just these two sites combined here. Um, I think everyone's familiar with this. Why don't we go to the next one? This is an aerial shot. Uh, just to give you the context, again, the uh, commuter rail station here, the MBTA station, the commuter rail right here. Uh, this is the Prescott, is Prescott Street here and the four-story existing building here. We have the three- and one-story building here and all of us, the associated parking in the back here. We also have a series of uh, single-family homes along Washington Street that butt up against the site from the rear. Uh, I think a lot of the, those folks were at the meeting last night with Matt, and they had a, a good discussion about some of the concerns about the abutters here. Uh, the existing site has two entrances, uh, one from Prescott, which is this arrow right here, the other one uh, from, uh, from Lincoln Street. <coughs> um, if you go to the next slide, you'll see that we're basically keeping them, but shifting them a little bit. We have, we're keeping an entrance off of Prescott Street for the building. It's really two buildings, building A and building B, which are five-story buildings, one story of parking, and then four stories of stick frame above with a slope roof. Um, so we, our intention was to have an in and out here, but an exit only um, onto Lincoln. Uh, Lincoln um, that, just let me back up a little bit. The um, the traffic is something that has really not been studied, that's something that's ongoing, that was something that needs to be done as we get further into the project, there'll be a, a more detailed traffic study. This is obviously conceptual, but we're just trying to show that how, what we think is the right approach for vehicle entries in and out of the site with this, with this diagram. Next, please. Uh, the outlines here are the two existing buildings that will be demolished. This is the, um, the one on Prescott Street. It's about 150 feet long, along Prescott. The other one uh, is about an 80-foot frontage along uh, Lincoln. If you go to the next one, you'll see that the new, um, the new frontage, it goes from 150 to 170 feet along Prescott, and we keep approximately the same frontage of 80 feet along Lincoln, uh, although it's a little bit set back from it. This building along Prescott is actually pretty much in line with the existing building that's there right now, the four-story um, storage building, people call it. Uh, next, please. Um, one of the things we're trying to do uh, is provide a little bit of a buffer to the, uh, the abutters in the property on the backs and the side of this property. That's what this, these green uh, portions represent here. Um, we're still trying to get some here. It's a very tight site right now on the back. So we did talk with the neighbors last night. And I believe uh, Matt and the development team have committed to, if they can't put it on their property, trying to put some more green buffer with the permission of the owners on their property if they want to see a tree or some plantings or whatever to try to give a, a better green buffer between 
obviously the, the scale of the existing houses here and the larger development here. Next, please. Um, this is going to be a series of diagrams just showing, taking you through the floor plans of the site. We'll, we'll start with the parking, go to a typical floor and show the roof, and then we'll get into the elevations. We can talk about um, how they came to be. Again, existing conditions here. This is the Prescott. The other building in the corner is not part of the development. If you go to the next slide, it shows the property outlines and the red dots here. You can see what the outline of the property is, as we discussed. Uh, next slide is the parking layout. Again, I mentioned before, we're going to come in and out off of Prescott here. We have approximately um, one car per unit right now, 77 units. Uh, we have two buildings, building B and A. Building A is slightly larger, uh, building B over here. And we have the exit one way onto Lincoln Street on this side as well. We also are activating this corner with the elevators in the lobby and the uh, stairs. That will be a very pedestrian friendly zone. And again, we have those buffers along the edges here in the light green color. I see a couple questions along Please. the way here. John. Uh, when we did, uh, oops, when we did uh, Haven Street, I forget the ratio of parking to units. I think it was one and a half. One and a quarter. One and a quarter. They actually put in more than that. But the, as, de as designed, it was one and a quarter. They they built it with more. A little bit more. With, to what degree do any of our parking rights cover the, this? This will be exempt from all zoning as a 40B. It'll bypass local zoning. <coughs> and it'll be um, a comprehensive permit to the Zoning Board of Appeals. But they don't have any rules. What, what is the uh, bedroom count in these apartments? Are they apartments or condos? They're or all apartments. 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 They would have to be, I guess. Right now, they're all planned as apartments. Um, yeah. Which, you know, obviously finding the right balance for the parking ratio is important just from a, a market <coughs> standpoint as well. Um, being on the train is, is one factor, being downtown. Yeah. So right now, 70% uh, of the units are one bedroom units. Okay. Um, so uh, as we get further That's with helpful. the traffic study and reports and the data on you know, how many demand for one bedrooms by train stations and all the data that's out there. So um, w we're still looking at that ratio, but that's you know, from based on discussions yeah. about 30 Haven maybe having too many and not wanting to put more than we need, but it's an ongoing uh, we, discussion. In we don't need so. to tell you, probably walk that neighborhood during the uh, commuting hours, there's not a spare parking spot to be had there's around. Spillover is the real concern. Right. If you're depending on any spillover, um, you're, you're taking what's already an untenable situation. That's my concern. Is <coughs> one that we probably, I'm not in construction, but it seems below what I would expect. For, even for a one bedroom, you typically may have two people with your car. Um, and the police chief has expressed concerns about parking. <coughs> That will be probably one of the biggest concerns on that because as someone who regularly commutes, um, I need to get to that parking area generally 20 minutes before yep. the train leaves in order to basically make it even worth driving down there. So when you're adding 77 units um, and if um, there's 95 cars, um, you know, it should be made clear that the expectation of those folks who are going to be renting there is that you know, th there's going to be strict competition for those spots, and it, it shouldn't. Uh, so I, I would I would look at adding more parking. One, just for the neighbor, but also for the marketability of your unit. As um, Chief Burns, I'm not familiar with how it's different firefighting with a building that's built on tiers, but have you looked at this? Yes, we had a development review team meeting last week, and he has very strong concerns about that and other things to do with uh, safety, public safety. How would you get to the back of the building? Exactly. Right. That's one of them. And um, the height and the clearance, since you're putting the parking underneath the building, now you've got to get a, v a fire apparatus underneath. Right. So the clearance is an issue. And is that, are those concerns also exempt from any further challenge? Um, at this point, what they've asked for from Mass Housing is a letter of approval. So um, those issues will probably be, if Mass Housing gives them the green light and says, then we'll have to hammer through how to do the parking, there'll be a parking study, um, pub any of the concerns about public safety. There's a concern on the height that the fire chief has expressed um, with the fire code. So as we get into fire codes and building codes, then they will have to con conform to that. Um, but they, they don't <coughs> have to conform to any zoning codes. And this density, uh, this, no, this is a good question, this kind of density of that a stressor for any of the other utilities, whether it be water, sewer, electrical? 
Yeah, we, we don't know, um, but that would definitely have to all be worked out in the plans. I mean, this, this density is five times what is allowed in the Smart Growth District, and that's a dense district. So, um, and it's apartments, which means you have more um, turnover in terms of residents, right? Yes, and there's, I think, seven three bedrooms? Eight. Eight three bedrooms. So that's a little, we haven't seen that yet in any of the developments. There have been, haven't been any three bedrooms. That, that's not by choice. That's, uh, that's, that's a state requirement. Yeah. Affordable yeah. Component. Yeah. No, we, under 40B we now you have to have 10% of the units as three right. bedrooms. But the town will get credit for all 77? Yes, as product. rental. Can you define 40B for us? It's a mass general law that basically allows developments to go through a separate process, which is a comprehensive permit process from the Zoning Board of Appeals. Because Reading does not have the state mandate of 10% of our housing units as affordable, we haven't met that goal yet, we're close, but we're not there, then that creates the opportunity for the comprehensive permit avenue for uh, developments to come in that way and bypass local zoning and do it as, you know, this kind of density and this parking is not, you know, you can't, it, it just, they can do, you know, based on a study, they can have some, we can have some role from the Zoning Board of Appeals, but they don't go by what our parking requirements are, they don't go by what our height is, they don't go by any of our zoning requirements, um, and they can just, it's meant to be a, a denser development. Uh, could you identify yourself for the record? Tom Spiros. Thank you. <coughs> Property owner, my wife's property owner, but my property owner of 22 Prescott Street, okay. which abuts both Prescott and Warren. Thank you. John? The, the white donut, the center <coughs> building A, is that an opening or um, is that meant to be a court, courtyard or so? No, I'm sorry. The, I can show you the plan above. This is actually parking in the middle. This is a drive out all around here that connects now. So you'll see the building above is actually almost U shaped and there's a little bit of a courtyard here. So the intent of the white is to convey what? Well, that's just non-parking space. It's, it's, a, it's, just, it's just a striped area that you can't park okay. on. It's not large enough. You can put a bike there, but you can't put right. anything. You can't put a vehicle legally there. Yeah, keep it. Okay. Um, sorry. Keep going. Next one. Yeah. Yes. The um, so uh, sorry. Back. Can you go back one. We went past the typical four. Yeah. This is the typical floor plan. There's four levels here, of of uh, housing. You can see the dividing lines. The smaller units are obviously the one bedrooms, uh, double loaded corridor, and then there's building uh, A and B here, they're connected as well. The pink are the stairs, and the, this is the lobby and the entrances over here. So this is four stories above the parking. And the next one shows the roof plan. It was very important for us to have a, a sloped roof that was in the character of what's around it. We, a flat roof is, uh, we, we got the feedback from the neighbors, et cetera. So these are all gable roofs with, uh, with uh, uh, dormers and end gables. So we're trying to articulate this roof and break it up and make it somewhat fit into the more the, uh, the context, which is the, uh, the slope roofs that exist all around it, obviously at a different scale. Uh, next one. Please. Yes, Mary. Yeah, I just um, have a question about, about the roofs. I, I, I had a chance to go through your packet a little bit, and it looked like with the five stories, with the gable roof <coughs> and some of the peaks, you're going to hit with five stories about a 63-foot uh, height. That's at the peak of the roof, yes. At the peak, well, that's the... Yep, the top of it, whereas the current bill that was only a little bit about 40, 43, 44 is what we So it's almost a 40% increase in just in height. Uh, and so that that's a little concerning for folks who kind of look behind there that <coughs> now you're putting something that's even that much, even sure. though it's pretty to look at, granted, than what's there now, sure. it's still 40% higher than what currently is there. Let me, let me address that. It's a valid point. Um, this is the... Um, this is where the roof takes off here at the fourth floor. We've integrated the fifth floor into the roof so that the roof starts sloping at about roughly the, a few feet above what the existing roof line is now, and obviously it slopes back. So you're right, this, at this point you are at 63 feet, but down here you're almost 20 feet lower where it starts sloping back in terms of the, the massing of this thing. So we don't feel, it will feel like a 63 foot tall building because if it was flat, obviously it would that would feel like six stories. It's really, we're trying to break it down so that it, it's really a base and a middle and a height, and we try to make the, the top floor feel like it's part of the roof as dormers, as you know, windows, rather than as a full floor that is the usual about 10 feet tall. So that's one of the ways we try to articulate this building a little bit. 
We also made sure that the parking level, which is behind this lower level, is pedestrian friendly. We have glass, we have you know canopies, we have entrances, um, we have the building entrance on the corner here. This is the Prescott Street elevation, by the way. Um, so we you know we're trying to put large windows, textured uh, materials. We're articulating the wall so it's not flat; it's broken up. Um, we've got these brackets in the corner, deep overhangs. We're trying to get, create shadow. So we don't we don't want a flat building because it, it's one of the ways you make an improvement on these buildings is to break it down so it feels like smaller pieces. You know, these are six by six foot windows, uh, these, these ones here. Um, again, large eaves, the entrances, and also different types of materials, different textures, <coughs> different colors of, of, of panels, of fiber cement, and other shingles. And it, gives, it has that residential texture and quality that we think is so important to the success of this type of building. Is there any retail component to this at all? There is not. Okay. There's just there's just the bottom is parking, and then there's the lobbies and the stairs, and that's really all there's room for. We have a question in the audience. There was a, yeah, are there people. decks built on the back? Uh, there are no balconies or decks no. that I've seen. Uh, we've designed at this point now. Okay. And the, the elevation of the back should be pretty much comparable to this. We intend to keep the same materials on all four sides of the building, no matter. So my where concern is just that at that height, if there are balconies and people are out there till ten o'clock at night, no. that thing. No, I, 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 we've seen that before. That's that's usually uh, we're very careful not to do that, and also the people who are in the building can control that as well. But we don't we don't have any balconies on this right now. The next slide, please. Can I uh, ask a question? Sure. Could you um, identify yourself, please? Uh, yes, Jody Abjus, and um, I um, <coughs> own the. If you go back to the map that shows uh, uh, Prescott and Arlington Street together, mm -hmm. anyway. If you would just keep going back, keep going back. Okay, fine, right there, that's fine. Um, so there's a house. If you can see that house on the left, yeah, right there, yep. That house, very small, two family house, is for sale. It's sold. Oh, it's sold. Okay, fine. Um, that's too bad because it wouldn't have been would have been helpful to have purchased it and then had that for no, more. No, because that would have been on my property. Huh? Oh, yeah. Because the building would have been next to my property. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And um, the second question is, see across, across the street, there's a white truck. <laughs> right there. That guy, that truck has been there for at least 15 years. So... If you got rid of that, there's a little more parking. Or could you purchase that some of that? I have a shared shared parking arrangement, that, which is color. So it's a very much. It up. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll continue to, to investigate, you know, parking, and as, as we go through the process, creative solutions would be very welcome. And yeah. so we're, we're, you know, we're, it's the beginning of the process, and we're kind of just taking in all the comments, and got as it. we keep moving yeah. forward, we'll look at all those. Uh, uh, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, Linda. When the snow docks are. Um, I'm actually wondering whether your plan has any social spaces built into it so that the residences can nurture community within and have a space to get to know each other. And, um, we, we, we haven't, uh, it's still preliminary schematic inside. So uh, from one, that point to just yeah. the marketability of the building. Um, I've been involved with uh, residential apartments all over and to see where that need, um, the ebb and flow, some places use it more and some don't, so trying to find that right mix of, um, you know, something like a gym or, you know, something like a little business place inside or even a meeting room. Or usually what you find today is a lot of flex spaces that could be used for different things inside of a building. So um, as, as we continue to develop the plans with the architect, we're uh, <coughs> looking at, you know, different ideas inside the building. So we haven't got that far yet. I don't think we put anything in yet, but we haven't really, you know, broke that subject. Okay, Barry. While you have that slide up there, just it kind of really, um, in a nutshell, kind of talks to sort of the real complexity of the site. I mean, you, you're, you're planning on building fairly nice uh, rental apartments whose market rents are probably higher than most people's mortgages. Yet, right at the tip of that site is an automotive use that, um, to be kind, is not as nicely facaded as maybe your building is nice. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I know that efforts have been made to try to acquire that parcel, and obviously, if it were, we'd, we'd be looking at a much different design. 
Um, but can you just talk to how you have a plan on marketing around that? And um, it, it just it just doesn't seem to kind of it seems like you're shoehorning this project into that space, and that and, 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 and without that corner piece, it just it just doesn't seem to kind of work. I think or, and or, have you uh, tried to purchase yeah. some yeah. <coughs> yeah, I, I uh, think the real draw to a site like this is obviously being on the train. Um, <clears throat> you know, you look, at, even on the other side of tracks, there's a lot of automotive here. So I think the downtown's in a transition uh, phase where um, to make it more welcome and more uh, pedestrian friendly, you, and you need more people to live there. You need businesses like they have at 30 Haven. So clearly from a design standpoint and the architect would love to say I have that corner and 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 maybe there's more different things we could do with it I don't think it would change the feel or look of our building it may change where it sits and, and some of the layout um, but the draw to a site like this is being so many feet from the train so many you know downtown um, so from a marketability it, it probably doesn't hurt it as much as it does from a design standpoint because the units will look the same inside, they'll be you know, high quality and, and the building will look as nice. Is it the ideal situation? <coughs> is there maybe a better design with that corner? Probably, but um, you know, it's not. And having said that, if there was an avenue yeah. to you consider you that parcel. Could you please you identify yourself and wait, wait till I recognize you? Ms. Atkins had her hand up. Could you? Maybe this is yeah. what the gentleman's getting at. Have you okay. attempted to uh, purchase that Family, you know, it's the brown. No, oh, this one. No, no, the high. Yes, right. Your other one, you said, yeah. Yeah. I certainly would right beside the corner there. Where's the yeah. Fulton and yeah, that's a, right uh, a two family, I think. Have you yeah. attempted to purchase it? That particular is that you? you go ahead. That, that particular property, we, we haven't yet, but we, you know, it's, uh, you know, we're open to suggestions. There's another one on Washington Street too that um, seems to be run down. Um, it may be, and I don't know, know if it's in an estate or something, so we'll look at that also. Sir, do you have a comment? Uh, I was just gonna address the question that came up. Uh, Ken Chase with New Meadow Development, okay. part of the development team. Yep. Um, what I was gonna uh, I'll just add to the response to Mr. Roman's question was that, um, that site is still something that we're interested in. So, uh, you know, in our minds anyway, the conversation isn't over. And we're just kind of at a, a point where we feel like we've exhausted at least our our uh, uh, immediate avenues to try to make a deal. John, and then just a reminder for those in, in the audience, there are people that are watching at home and they desperately want to hear your questions because I bet they mirror their own. So the microphones are in the ceiling. Just stand, give your name, the street you live on, and uh, your voice will live on from <laughs> Hi, Jean Thomas is 21 Arlington Street. So I'm concerned about this footprint at the ground level and at the height level. I live on the other side of Prescott Street. Yes. So, you know, Washington Street has a buffer of trees, and I'm very. You mean Prescott? The other side of Prescott Street. I'm very empathic with the people on Washington Street, but they, you know, they do have their trees. There's something there. Let's and so let's look across the street and what's the buffer for people on Arlington Street or Prescott Street? We have very little buffer. I'm concerned about the lighting, and I'm concerned about the fumes. Very much concerned about the fumes. If you have cars entering and exiting right across from me. Um, I'm concerned about the sun, you know, with such a high building, the footprint of the, the height and, and what it will do to the, the effect of climate and in the terms of sun. And I'm, as a teacher in the system, I'm concerned about the impact on the schools, sure. you know, what we would anticipate would be the student population going into that building. And because Arlington Street is so vulnerable to parking circumstances as it is now. We have parking on one side of the street only. There's no parking until 10.30 in the morning. But these things are taken advantage of. And as homeowners, we can't park in front of our houses until 10.30 in the morning. So 
It's a matter of the parking, the height of the sun, the lighting at night in particular. Sure. The density of the parking, having two entrances on a residential street. Perhaps the, the in and out could be on the train side. That's, that's a commercial side. That's an already, we've got the fumes and the sound of the train. Sure. Sound of the train is good. Fumes, not, not so good. So <laughs> all of these concerns sure. I ask you to consider. They're, all reason, they're very reasonable concerns, all of them. Uh, one thing I'll just mention briefly, the, um, the garage is probably going to have a mechanical system uh, within it because it won't be open <coughs> enough because of the way we've designed it to be, you know, more enclosed than not. So that would cover a lot of the, you know, obviously cars coming out just like they would on the street, you can't do much about that, but the cars within the footprint will be dealt with with a mechanical system. Um, what does that mean? It, it just means that there's um, fresh air and there's air changes and, the, and the, any fumes are captured usually with those systems as much as possible. Versus an open air garage which has nothing, you know, which is just the air flowing through it. So that's not what we have. What here. part is open? O only the entrance and exit or is it the whole floor? Um, it's open at the, at the um, actually this is the is entrance, it it? this is the entrance of the garage right here, right, right there. So, but the rest of it along uh, both sides and some of the back, but not all of it, is in, is enclosed here with a wall and glass. So it's, 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 it, it, you might not even know this car is there if you, if you're just walking by and you didn't know any better because of that. Because we wanted that to feel more friendly pedestrian, not to see car grills. You know, the glass could be fritted or you know textured so that it won't you yeah. the lighting's an important issue too and we yes. would obviously deal with that um, not having balconies means there's no lights outside so you're just looking at the glow from the windows which obviously this is like there's things that Matt and the development team can deal with those lighting issues to make sure that your concerns are addressed. There's very little setback right now. Yes. There's almost no setback. That's right. How are you going to put greenery there? Or is the greenery right. taking up more than the I think in this segment. rendering, it's actually pretty much in the sidewalk, I think, because it's the building in place is very close to where it is the now. The sidewalk's kind of the street at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. So please think about the height sure. yeah. and the setback. <coughs> <coughs> Thank you. Okay, the lady in the back. 76 Washington Street. So we moved to Reading because um, we're facing the park and it's really quiet. So can you expand a little bit on the parking garage right now? My house gives me we'll see the building <coughs> where the garage will park right now. So it's a concern of hearing cars on the back of our house, and now we're living on a one-way street in front of a park, and we'll have a big parking garage in the back. So how much is going to be open in our backyard? Um, I frankly think it's going to look more like this than not, um, but we haven't, we haven't fully got there yet because we don't, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that are, in motion right now. We're just talking about three or four changes to the site potentially, which obviously would change everything. But the intention was to, as much as possible, to landscape the back to provide a green buffer between the houses. And if it's not enough to do it on the property itself, we would try to, if, with your permission, we would do it on your property to give it as much possible a green buffer along that entire back. But it's really hard. The, uh, the building comes so close to our yeah. lot that you know you can put a few yeah. trees, but if it's open right there, you yeah. know. Well, the the, uh, the pressure of parking pushes those cars closer. If we the building itself is actually not on the back lot; it's actually about ten or twelve feet back off the property line in the back against your property. Um, so it seems awfully yeah. close right now. But <laughs> well, but I'm talking about um, that's right up here. Yeah, can you parking go goes sorry, up. Sorry, head two. One more. Yeah, this is what I was talking about here. But there was parking on the other plane. The, the other plane shows parking right up to the line. Right. Yeah, that's correct. That's a lot. Right, but if we could compress this as much as possible, to maybe make this one way so that this aisle could be four or five feet shorter, you'll get a green buffer in between there. There's ways to do that once we get into more detail. All right, uh, John, and then the gentleman in the back. Go ahead. Uh, sir, what's the plan to service the building for trash pickup or emergency vehicles? Or yeah, um, these buildings usually have a, a trash and recycling chute that all the residents go to, and, and the, it's collected in the in the um, in here in the garage level and, and wheeled out in two two yard containers and picked up outside. That's usually what we do. There's no dumpsters anywhere. There's no. It's all in an enclosed room. Or so often it's in these type of white spaces we talk about. We store it all there. 
and it's picked up a couple times a week. It's normally how these buildings are operated. So when a big dump truck comes, a big garbage truck comes, and how does it get from your waste space to the truck? It has to be wheeled out by the people who run the building. Okay. Um, have you thought about uh, reducing the parking below ground level to accommodate the height, the overall height? Is that, is that a possibility? I think it is. I think Matt it, um, has studied. They're, 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 they haven't got everything back from the site yet, you know, but I think that they're going to look at that and try to depress it as well. We, just so you know, also, this podium, this is a podium project. It's a, got a, it's, it's called, you, know, you have four stories of stick frame, wood frame above, but by code, you have to have a concrete and steel fire separation. So it's like a platform you build a wood building on top of. Below is the parking. Right. Those do not normally have fire trucks go through them because you, you would make in the building a lot taller to deal with a 14 foot truck plus structures. You actually want it to be lower because it's fully sprinkled both the garage and the other building. Most, most of these products, and these are all over Greater Boston, there's, there's dozens of these. They, none of them have fire trucks that drive into the garage. Like most parking garages only have about an eight foot clearance. Any parking garage you go in in Boston or anywhere really will only have yeah, about at maximum eight foot uh, clearance. So there's never an intention that a, a fire truck would come here because that would make the building even taller. We want to make it even lower. So you'd use stand pipes to hook up from the outside? Absolutely. Yeah. There's stand pipes in every stair. They can yeah. fight. These are fully sprinkled. There's a dry system in the garage. Uh, it's fully, it's, it's a standard, it's a standard building type that the fire departments across Massachusetts have accepted. Right. We had a question in the back. Uh, can you identify yourself, sir? Yeah, Tom Keegan, 90 Washington Street. Yes, I asked this question last night at the meeting. I didn't get an answer, so I'm going to ask again. If the garage sells, it becomes part of the project, does that mean the units go up beyond 77? Uh, and, you know, at this point, we kind of went into this last night. It's, it's, you know, part of it's the economics of it. We don't have control of that site yet. We, we, we try. Um, it may, it may change the look of the building. And I, I would imagine, given that, you know, uh, it's a cost to purchase that, um, there'll be some change. But at this point, um, it, until we have it, it's kind of hard to say what that looks like. And, and if we are able to purchase that, um, you know, obviously, we'll be working on a revised plan and, and bringing that back to, uh, to the board, to the neighbors first, and then to the selection. And then seems to me your work is going to drive up that property value. <laughs> so you may, that may actually make it harder. So, so the gentleman's question was, would there be more than seventy-seven units? Uh, yes, right. I'd imagine likely. that for I'd likely, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Yes. So, I'm Tom Spiros from Twenty Two Prescott Street. Sorry. So, if they purchase either of these houses. So 24, 26 is sold. We don't know who the we don't know who the buyer is yet. I, I'm not aware of who the buyer is. We don't know if he may resell or she may resell to this property at some point. Does that then exclude it from being a 40B construction site once he purchases a residential property and abuts that and, and builds on top of residential property? Are you saying? So this is a 40B development, yeah. right? Because it's on a, because it's on such a development, and because he's buying a specific building. No. Yeah, no. it doesn't run to the building. It's the permitting process. So anybody can can go through this process, mm -hmm. because um, Reading is not at the 10 percent requirement Got for it. the total housing units being affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why we are vulnerable. To 40 B's anywhere in the town. Got it. Okay. Any neighborhood could get a 40 B. <coughs> Many have. Yeah, very, very and then a follow up question to Mr. Keating's question. Yes. Um, so, again, um, you know, going into the future a little bit, if you are able to acquire the site of the garage, and Mr. Keating's question was, well, is that just going to make this project answer? My question would be if you're able to acquire that, would you be open to putting, reconfiguring the project so you can put some retail? in there and have more of a mixed use project, which is kind of what Haven Street is, um, which most people would think is, is, is wide, widely successful. We've had discussions internally and with the town about the retail on the site. Um, you know, what, what retail works is, you know, I mean, is it you're talking just the professional office or, you know, market? I mean, so trying to figure out what that is. Um, clearly, uh, without with, with the corner, maybe there's an opportunity. Yeah. I, yeah the viability of retail on this site in terms of, you know, from the retail standpoint, you know, how strong is that? Um, for what would work there, taking into account traffic and parking and all those other factors that you would have to consider on the site. So, 
Um, that's why it's hard to say, answer the question, if we had the corner, what does that mean? Because it could mean retail, it could mean more units, it could be a different design, you know, and, and some of that factors in with what, what you pay for it. You know, right, my my question is, so. is, would you be open to a redesign that includes retail? We, we'd be open to exploring it, and we, I think we've already had explored retail on the site, so <coughs> yes is the short answer. Well, let me get that was a lot of the comments that I got from. Can we get questions from people that have not, then I'll come back to people that have already spoken. Uh, gentleman on the end here. Yeah. <coughs> Nick Aiello, uh, 9294 Washington Street. Uh, I had a chance to speak with Ken and Matt yesterday about this, but one of my major concerns here is just the sheer scale of the building, the height. I, um, the house is has one of the backyards that goes up against the, the, the back of the development. And um, you know, right now, the building that's there currently is not pretty by any means, but it is you know, 50 feet away or something. Now we're talking about yeah. within a couple feet of the property line going up five stories. So I know that we've <coughs> talked about possibilities for to try to mitigate that a little bit with trees and things. It's really hard for me to even envision how a tree would even, I don't know, help with that situation at all. That loss of privacy, those families that, that live in that and try to you know enjoy that, that, that space, that yard. It seems to me that 80, 90 percent of the questions in this room would be satisfied if you could cut one story out of this building A. If that does not affect your financial viability, I think it's a, a serious consideration I would commend to you to think about. Understanding we don't we don't control this, but I think that solves an awful lot of these issues. Uh, gentlemen over here, then I'll get to Ron. <coughs> My main question here is you've got the overhang right close to the um, street. So as I'm walking to the train in winter, how often should I expect ice to fall on me because it's just a big man? Uh, Ron. Yes. Uh, I, I'm Ron Bizarre, I'm going to show in the summer. Uh, I was wondering if you got the garage, if you were able to have a garage, maybe that might be a reason for you to eliminate one story where you might be able to get more residences or something like that. Uh, it, it does seem to me, you know, <clears throat> I don't know why we always have to have something, uh, you know, you're right on the boundary line, five stories up, it's the end of sunlight for some people. Uh, I would ask, you know, we always say, well, will the financial, the finances don't work. What about the human life and quality of life of the people around it? Do the finances not work. I mean, why not, you know, eliminate at least one story. Have some setback. I mean, it's nice of you to offer to have a buffer in other people's property. I mean, come on now. You, you, you've got the property. I mean, you know, make it work. So maybe you don't have 70 something units. You know, maybe you got 50. Um, and I would hope that the finances All right, I'm Paul Stoddard from 96 Washington. Our house literally butts up against the certain Wood location, and I second, I agree with everybody. We have two little kids. We moved into a, we thought, a nice, quiet, you know, our house is a 150-year-old house and neighborhood, and now we're going to, our kids are going to be looked out the window and see a monster building that will overshadow any sun. We have gardens in the back that will probably not get sun now. It's just disappointing to... I think that's, you know, just build a new playground down the street and just, you know, the Washington streets are one way, the cars come down, they're parking on both sides, there's uh, parking regulations from May to, you know, November to May, they can only park on one side, they're, you know, it's, you can't get the garbage trucks down the streets because of the congestion of traffic, you know, it's just, it's really not good. I don't think that's on any of it. Camille. Oh. Camille Anthony. Orchard Park Drive. Uh, do you know how what height building our fire department is now capable of fighting the fires at? What the height level is of our ladder trucks, etc.? Probably more than that. <coughs> they can easily hit this height, but they can't hit the back of the building. That's the issue. So From the front, they can certainly address the roof. They can. 
so should this development go forward, who's responsible for uh, buying the fire equipment in order to meet the fire needs? There is no fire equipment available that can service the back. That right, which means we it's going to have to be purchased. There is no such thing. No. There is no exist. such thing? I mean, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not a fire expert coming up, but a lot of that would probably be done inside with standpipes and internal fire suppression. That they go in the building. And do that kind you of can only get the one side of this, yeah. then this building with the fire truck. Everything else is landlocked. Go ahead. In, in regards to that, James, the code, there's not much that the town can do as far as the police recommendation on traffic studies or uh, the chief burns recommendation on uh, you know, fire equipment. Well, the 40B. What well, exactly are the parameters that, that those two bodies have to say anything? Well, w at this point, the town is able to put together a comment letter, which we have drafted, um, and we have all the comments of all the different departments, like the two chiefs. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll try and make the argument, and we, we do in our letter, that there might be some other ways of going at this rather than a 40B. Mm -hmm. um, we. We were hoping, and we've been working with MAPC on visualizations for um, expanding the 40R district. In fact, this originally was in the 40R district. And under 40R, um, if it's all residential, you can only go up 33 feet. So, um, you know, and, and you would be required to go mixed use if you were going to go 45 feet. It was, yeah, back in 2009. Not by staff. It was the Board of Selectmen. Yes. Okay. Not, this board. <laughs> Not this board. Not this board. But it was in there. You're on. Uh, for the record, my name is Jeff Engler with SEB. We're 40B consultants and developers. We've been involved with the permitting and development of 12,000 units of multifamily housing. And I'd actually like to answer some of the general questions, that hopefully for the benefit of the neighborhood. Uh, many might be sitting here thinking, geez, you know, a lot of the, the developers don't seem to have answers to some of these questions, or what's the deal, why haven't they thought of this? I think it's important to recognize that this is a long process, and this is really the beginning where an application for site approval has been submitted to Mass Housing. The town is now within its 30-day comment period to submit comments to Mass Housing about the development, and I would recommend, as it sounds like the town is doing, to incorporate all the comments from, from the board and other boards and, and, and groups in, in the town, as well as the neighborhood, to mass housing, so that those comments can receive their proper attention as the process moves forward. Mass housing will evaluate this application primarily at more of a conceptual 30,000 foot level. Does this site generally work for residential housing? What's around it? Does the developer have the financial capability to do this? Is it more or less consistent with what the town wants? And they'll evaluate that, and if they feel that the site is worthy to move forward, they'll issue what's called a site approval letter. That's basically the applicant's ticket to move forward with the Reading Zoning, Bo Zoning Board of Appeals. It's at that process really where where we need to more technically and specifically answer many of these questions. A landscaping plan, a utility plan, a grading and drainage plan, more, more advanced architecturals. That's where all the technical dialogue occurs. Traffic, parking, all of those things. So I, I wanted the neighbors to know that there's going to be many more hearings. It's a long process in terms of talking about those those technical elements, and the town is within its right to hire peer review consultants, so the town will not take the applicant's word for traffic or for other things. They have the right, they can do it internally. I'm not sure how Reading has handled previous 40Bs, but they can <coughs> hand, hire a consultant to look at stormwater management, to look at traffic, to look at all of those other technical related issues uh, that really the applicant has to demonstrate that it can meet the threshold and the criteria. It, it was kind of characterized a little bit that 40B is just, oh, let's do a 40B and build something and it'll be great. There are 
there are uh, waivers that are that are requested and can be granted by the zoning board under 40B that the developer will not have to adhere to certain waivers uh, that the town requires, but it's not a willy-nilly process. The developer needs to meet all DEP requirements, all <coughs> DEP stormwater management, traffic safety, so it, it's not an arbitrary kind of analysis that goes on. There are very specific measurements that the developer will have to meet. And then regarding a couple of other things, and we're involved with a lot of projects and frequently parking is brought up. More and more developments, particularly in these kinds of locations, the state and others are encouraging parking to go down, not up. And we're finding ratios going down, not up, because the people, particularly um, millennials and whatnot, are not having cars with the same frequency that people my age are elderly. And it's a proven fact that people have fewer cars. And also, this is in a mixed use area. People say would like to see mixed use, would like to see retail. Retail requires much more parking than residential. Moreover, residential complements all the people going to work because the people that live here, they'll be leaving if they drive during the day and coming home at night and the people using the train leave at night. So it's a symbiotic relationship. Don't take my word for it. Those are the types of things that will have to come out through the analysis. Um, also, under 40B, and we hear it a lot, and it's a valid question, but impact on schools is, is not a valid criteria to evaluate a 40B project because it, it's sad to say, but pretty much every municipality that we work in, put it frankly, hates children because of the school age impacts. You would never build a single family house yes. if you considered school age impacts because single family housing is family housing. This is not family housing. <coughs> and it will be fiscally positive for the town of Reading because one bedrooms and studios and even two bedroom units do not produce school aged children. Will there be some children in three bedroom units? There will, but when you consider the whole development and the tax implications of all the studios and ones, it'll be a home run from the, for the town from a, from a, a revenue standpoint in, in that regard. Um, so those are just some high level things um, relative to process. It's a long process, there's lots of opportunities to provide comments, uh, and, and certainly we welcome a lot of the comments that, that people have made, and it, it, those are the types of comments that um, ultimately can make a better project. And the, and the last thing I would mention relative to um, acquiring a, additional parcels, I, I put my developer hat on, <laughs> Well, that is certainly viable. There comes a time where you got to fish or cut bait because you can't be redoing plans. You can't be, once you're before the zoning board, you, if you add a parcel, you got to go back in and not start, start from scratch, but pretty close. So there's a time where you've made your best effort and then you just got to, you, you got to, you know, ride with, 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 with the car that you're driving. Um, so we're not at that point yet, but eventually, because otherwise you have a, a permit or you're going through and then we have owners come out and say, oh, buy my property. And it just, yeah. it, get, it gets bogged down. So, you know, I, I know my client is serious about, about those opportunities, but eventually it's kind of like, <coughs> this, is, this is the plan, this is the parcel, and this is what we're doing. Yeah. I want to state, this, this board wants development, we want the right scale of development. We had a hand in the back, John. <coughs> who, who added up first? Uh, I go over here. I'm Cadence Thomas, 21 Arlington okay. Street, which is in this picture at the very edge. Um, Arlington Street is the street that ends direct up uh, right about at the corner of this, this proposed project. Um, and Arlington Street is a one block long street, and it's often a cut through street for a lot of traffic, especially particularly when there's a train in town. People want to cut through and zip zip one way or the other. So there's a lot of traffic already moving through there. We have a very particular parking regulation on that block. There's no parking on one side and on the other side of the street, uh, there's no parking after uh, until 10.30 in the morning and that's to prevent uh, commuters from using the street. Um, I'm curious, to, so, you know, sometimes we have guests at our house and we need to use the street in front of our house. Other people in the neighborhood use the street in front of our house. I'm curious to know, for these 77 units where their visitors will park um, and, and what the impact will be on parking in particular on, on Arlington Street, which is 
the most obvious uh, place to park. That doesn't, the, the street Prescott has um, residents only parking. You have to have a sticker in order to park on that street. So Arlington Street would be, in front of my house, would be essentially the first space to go. Um, where, where, where will residents, uh, visitors park? Honestly, most of the projects that I've been involved with, um, if, if it all goes back to the, when the, even when zoning does apply, is that is that required for any apartment building? Most of them don't require visitor parking spaces. They, they just don't, most of them. Um, that hasn't been the standard for apartment buildings, whether they're 30 units or 300. They, they normally just don't have that. Um, there's obviously, you know, um, potentially some at night or weekend potential here that may not be true during the day. Presumably that most of the people, as you discussed, would would not be here during the day because they're, they're commuting, most likely. A lot of them probably in the town. Um, but there's no dedicated visitor parking that's part of this site. Yeah. Uh, John, yeah. Yeah. Um, just to respond to the gentleman's comment, this, this board, although relatively young, tenure here, is lived in the town probably in excess of two decades each, and we're no stranger to 40B. Uh, we've got another application in front of us now. We really are in it for the long haul, and while we understand the 40B exempts the developer from many of the zoning requirements, we do look for a cooperative and thoughtful response to our concerns. And many of the people here tonight are here because they are directly impacted. We aren't, but in the some greater sense, we are responsible for all those that aren't here tonight. And we are going to be looking for, I think, a responsible, thoughtful, and at the end of the day, accommodating approach. Um, obviously, this is the first round. I understand it's conceptual. There's a lot more cards to play before you see the final, but we get it. And uh, I, I understand if all the comments here are being taken in, but I, I wouldn't <coughs> ask the group to be as uh, proactive and responsive with this board as you can be. We understand we can't necessarily direct what you do. Um, but on the other hand, we have a vested interest as you do, as you do, to see that this turns out favorable for everyone. We're not looking for a, a greater congestion. We're not looking for an eyesore. These residents are not looking to make their lives more difficult or their children's lives more difficult. <coughs> and there's got to be a happy medium somewhere. So it's up to us collectively to find it. Uh, gentlemen over here. Hi, uh, Damon Lusk on uh, 52 Washington Street. <laughs> uh, really, just one comment and one question for the board. Uh, I definitely echo lots of the sentiments here. And, Consultant that was here speaking, I totally appreciate the candor and very good perspective on the process. But you guys are completely shitting yourselves about the parking. It just, I, I can't tell you how many, even every time the sidewalk has to be disrupted in this neighborhood, it completely, there's been many meetings around parking here. You guys are, you've got to study that more because it's, it's, you're, you're shitting yourself. Um, as, as far as the board goes, I'm curious if, if we fast forward and there's 77 units that are on board now, where do we stand as a town? And like how many units short are we before this is sort of settled? Commend that question. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, actually have a, um, an approved <coughs> housing production plan that the Board of Selectmen um, adopted uh, almost two years ago, and the state uh, also has approved it. So it's a, it's a roadmap to help us get there. The problem with the 10% requirement is as new units are added in the community, even though you're adding some affordable units, you're also adding to the total. And the way the state calculates it is not really accurate. You only catch up to the total with every decennial census. So even if we look like we're getting closer, when they update the next census, federal census, all those additional units that have been built during this housing boom and this construction boom are going to probably diminish whatever well, gains yeah, we've I made. Totally get it. I'm sure it's not a static linear equation, but is it, are, we, are we far? Like, is it a huge gap? Like 200 it's short. it's just under 200. Wow. But that's, that's if you put your hand on yeah, yeah, any further on. production of housing, <coughs> which we know isn't so what's happening. So the numerator of the fraction changes every year. The yeah. denominator changes every once every 10 years. Yes. So you so make so all this progress, and then whoop, you get yeah, pulled right so back. You so you can put 400 back. units at yeah. one side of town or at the other end of town. What you immediately do is drive that number you're chasing. It's like you can't catch it. Um, 
when, when that's the kind of development we have, that's one of the reasons that you look more for mixed use and some other commercial opportunity um, so that you can ultimately catch up. Uh, anybody who has not spoken? Uh, Ms. Aptis. Uh, so is there some chart? Like if you were to not do the building B, that shows like what the, okay, if, if you only had, you know, building A, whatever number of units, let's hope you reduced it by a level. That's how much you would need and that's how much the, to make it, I guess I'm looking for the numbers, like if you got rid of building B area, how much different would be your profit, I guess, that's what I'm looking for. Is there a chart like that somewhere? Okay, um, I want to try to wrap this up in the next 10 minutes or so. So do we have questions for anyone that has not raised their hand, Mr. Blodgett? Uh, Everett Blodgett, 99 Prescott Street, uh, director at Parker Cabin, uh, also of Walkable Ready. Um, I'd like to just point out to the selectmen, and I'm sure they know it, that that section of the street is where all the walking traffic funnels into from the west side of town. Uh, with the shadowing effect there, it's, it's just going to be huge. The, the building at 60 plus feet, is the shadow in the winter, which is the worst time, is actually going to be on the other buildings on the other side of the street for all day. And that makes all those people walking right past that building, which is just when it's going to be it's 185 or 75 feet an hour, just probably just treacherous ice and snow bags. So it's a real tough situation. All right. Uh, anyone else in the audience? Yeah, yes. Uh, I, to, to the gentleman's point about the unit count, uh, it is important. I think one of the board members mentioned it. But on a rental project, all 77 units count towards the town's affordable housing inventory, not just the affordable units, but the, the market units as well, as opposed to the home ownership project where only the uh, uh, affordable units count. So typically, municipalities are more favorable towards rental projects for that reason, because you are counting uh, the entire development as opposed to just 25%. So just to uh, expand on some of Jeff's comments, this is obviously a process and we're at the beginning. We met uh, with the neighbors last night, the director brothers, and had some insightful comments and concerns um, and some comments and questions and concerns from the board. And so, you know, it's you know, our job to kind of take those all in and see, you know, how that uh, shakes out. Uh, for shadow studies, you know, you do detailed shadow studies different times of the year, different hours of the day. Um, the way the building situated it, and you can see where the shadow is there. So that's all part of the aspect that when you go through the comprehensive permit process, all these working with the, um, our commit, we're still gonna work with the police uh, and the fire department, and, and we haven't just, it's so early, we haven't had those meetings yet, but that's stuff we're committed to doing as we move forward. So we've heard, you know, and we took, um, took in all the comments last night, it was great, and, and all the comments tonight, and we appreciate everyone's comments, so. Um, Know, we'll digest that information, kind of meet as a team, and then, yeah. All right, any final comments from the audience or the just, board? Just one last one. So, I mean, where, where do you gentlemen all live? You live in Massachusetts? I live in Medford. Medford? Walpole. Walpole. How close do you live to one of your sites? I live about a, a little bit less than a mile. I have three projects in Medford that I've designed that have been built in my town. So if you live right behind one of these, would you move? I think all my projects are worth, are, are beautifully worth it. Fair and they're, by the way, just the inside of these units are. Uh, we don't we don't see the inside of the units. We'll I never see the inside of the units. I, I wouldn't live in there, okay. so I don't care. I'm just curious about if you if you were direct to butter, and you someone walked in, <coughs> your wife and kids were there. Would you leave? Would you sell your property and move? Right. No, I think that calls for speculation on the. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> just 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 this is the last shot. Yep. One comment. I really appreciate your comment about the stewardship of this area and the town <coughs> as a whole. And so um, that's what, you know, we entrust that to all of you and appreciate you continuing to think of that stewardship. Thank you very much. You get it. Any final questions from the board? Uh, could you 
just walk us through what the next steps might be, uh, just for the benefit of the audience. Yeah. 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 So, uh, as, as Jeff said, we've applied to Mass Housing for a uh, site approval letter. Um, yep. Yeah, for the town's comments, I think they have a the, the rough time frame too. So, so yeah. and then once we get that, we'll, you know, we have some work to do on our end. We need to have mm -hmm. another neighborhood meeting, kind of work with the architect. So we're still, you know, some time away, another month or two from kind of putting that together. Um, it's quite a package you have to put together mm -hmm. to file. Um, but we're gonna internally look at this, and if you know, we uh, you know, yeah, maybe we have another meeting and just to present to the board um, you know, after you know public that comment for the site approval letter is expired, but to kind of show the board and give the board an update of where we stand. And like we told the neighbors last night, it was the first meeting of many. We met at Portland Pie and we'll you know, have another meeting there um, as we move forward, um, separate than the actual public hearings. Um, I think it's important to uh, involve the neighbors in early and often in the process. So we uh, I think obviously hope they know we're committed to doing that and we'll continue. All right, thank you very much. Thank, uh, you, thank you for everybody. Uh, it's been a great meeting. Uh, thank you for being very orderly and uh, for some very good questions tonight. Yeah. Okay, uh, take about a two minute break. Uh, thank you. Get ready for our next and final item.
2015 by a vote of a prior board of selectmen uh, that was so decreed back in 2012. And the uh, groups you're talking to tonight, are the, uh, could you put your hands up if you're here? Reading Falls Street Fair Committee. Thank you. Reading Climate Advisory Committee. Uh, Economic Development Committee. Uh, Reading Trails Committee. And Human Relations Advisory Committee. Thank you. The process is uh, tonight we're going to entertain discussion between the boards. Uh, we're not going to take any positions or vote tonight. We will do that at our next meeting. Uh, at that point, the board has, I think, three choices before it, either to continue the group for a term, you know, two, one, two, three year term, uh, recommend that it go under a different board, that board being willing to take it on, such as the school committee or RMLD, uh, who can now have committees and subcommittees, or to disband the board. So those would be the choices before us. So why don't we start out with the uh, Reading Fall Street Fair Committee, because that's the first on my file here. So <laughs> Come on up and introduce yourself to the audience. Uh, um, I'm Brian right. Snell. I'm the chairperson of the yeah. um, Reading Falls Street Fair Committee. The Reading Falls Street Fair has been in place now for um, five years. We this we will be having our sixth um, fair this year. Mm -hmm. um, so if you'd like to disband us, then you'll have to take over. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think right now what we're looking at is kind of continuing in status quo. Um, either at a, at a minimum of a year plus to get through the next next year's fair or um, probably the three year plus to get through the, the third year's fair. Uh, we are looking at um, potential options that might exist with respect to other entities taking over um, the fair, um, but we want to make sure that that transition is smooth and successful so that it won't interrupt the actual fair itself. Okay. Uh, you had taken a vote as a committee to disband some time ago in 2014? Well, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't know what we context. were doing. <laughs> okay. That was then and this is now? That was then and this is now. I think, um, you know, the, the Chamber of Commerce has expressed some interest and, uh, and we want to make sure that it's a good fit. And um, when we're comfortable that that's a good fit, then we'll transition and they they deserve an opportunity to transition over a period of time as well um, they don't want to have to kind of drop us off and pick things up so I think that mm -hmm. if we get that three-year extension that that will give them that transition yeah. period if that okay. is a workable solution but you see some definite I'm sorry you see uh, some definite well, advantages to going private in the long term uh, so uh, I, I think that the, yeah. the advantages to going private, the biggest advantage is the not having to comply with the open meeting yeah. laws. Um, but the new rules surrounding the associate membership designations will allow us to kind of up that flexibility as well. Because um, right now we we have the biggest trouble having oh, quorums. Yeah. And so if I've got associate members that are coming you can bring to the them meeting, in. then right. they can satisfy quorum requirements that Okay, way. that's good. Very good. Any other members of the... Um, to speak. I've brought uh, two other members of the committee, Sheila and Steve mm -hmm. Goldie, Sheila Mulroy. 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 Yes, <laughs> I knew that. And it's late. You guys were yeah. supposed to take us. I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, had, for us to we had some wind talkers tonight. Yeah. Um, but if they want to speak, they're welcome. Um, I, the only thing I was going to say, the reason we did talk about um, possibly disbanding was because of the issue with the quorum, but mm -hmm. if we have the opportunity to have associate members being um, voting members, that takes care of it. Our difficulty is that we meet most of the time during the summer, and we're dealing with summer vacations, so that would alleviate that problem. Okay, great. Anything else? Uh, any comments from the board? Uh, yeah, I have a question. Sure. So, so Sheila, do you think that having associate members solves the problem of needing to privatize or not privatize? At this point, yes. Uh, I mean, that was our biggest issue, was um, not being able to take a vote because uh, we had vacations mm -hmm. and we're, we've had a, um, a fairly small group. But we have a number of um, people who are volunteering who come to um, the meetings when they can. So it's, it's, a, it's a group that's very involved. It's just vacations get in the way. Well, and, and you know, th this committee's done unbelievable. The output is unbelievable. Right. I mean, it's fun, it's good, it's productive, it's healthy. We like
like it the day after, the day before. Yeah. We're not so sure. Well, I'm sure on the probably committee, starting yeah. about now till about then. It's not yeah. a lot of fun for yeah. you guys, but um, but you know the results are spectacular. So you know, from, or at least from speaking for myself, I mean, we want to help this thrive. Mm -hmm. So you know, you guys are the nerve center of this. What do you want? Right. I mean, do you want three? know three years plus do you want one year plus do you is the problem solved and you know the public forum is not a problem anymore I mean we need to yep. hear that from you yes yeah. uh, if, if I may Steve yep. Goldie um, former chair now retired from <laughs> the street fair as well um, the, the, the committee right now is working with the chamber the chamber is active in the meetings and is learning the process um, it, it's not a process that you can learn in a week a month or right. six months and you have to go through a fair or two to get through it. Mm. And that's what we're actually, and they just started. So that's what we're working through now to make it work. Um, you know, probably have a better answer for you will the associates work probably by the, after the fair this year. Tell you how well the committee worked and how, you know, if that solves the problem. Well, should, so, you know, if you could wave away a magic wand, would the committee want one plus, would it want 18 months, or would I it think want two years? Brian said between one and three, three to handle yeah. the out. Big well, celebration. I mean, every time you go to an even year, yeah. though, I mean, you have to be concerned that you're, you know, you're halfway through the planning process. Mm -hmm. So, oh, right. you know, right. so, right. I mean, so if you're going to go three years, that gets you two fairs. Right. Yeah. You know, essentially. Right. Um, and, and to answer your question, John, I'm not sure that the associate members is just, is going to be a definite fix either because we still have to comply with open meeting laws and it's the summer. It prevents us from, I mean, this is a very fluid um, process where yeah. there's a lot no, of last minute type of decisions that have to be well, made. The whole email thing, there's a whole yeah. lot of yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And so that sure. whole, all of those restrictions make it very difficult to operate there. And those were motivations to trying to get out from under the umbrella. Um, other motivations to get out from the under the umbrella was how the revenue is dealt with and, and, and that kind of stuff. But there was just so many unknowns surrounding um, if we privatize or if we don't, that it was easier to stick with kind of what we understood and what we knew okay. and work with that. And, and the associate members will help in, in one respect, but it still is gonna have its limits um, because of the open meeting laws. And privatizing, does take on a different flavor as well. We, we are in the business for not necessarily um, making a profit. Somebody else who's right. a profit, right. a, a private group is coming in and they're gonna, they, they need to make it worth their while. And right now this is our baby. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a difficult decision. Okay. Anything else? Yeah, just to echo John's comments, that the Fall Street Fair is probably one of the most visible um, successes of the town. And Except for the robots. It's, well, <laughs> I mean, it's the robots really yeah. cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's amazing, it's amazing what you can do is just when people aren't interested, you get some credit, right? Um, it strikes me the two decisions are, one, how do you make quorum, but then it also is, what does the group want to be when it grows up? Sheila was touching at it. The town involvement may actually be confining you in a way that either due to the open meeting or the, the finances or what have you, you may want to privatize, such an ugly word, you may want to go a different way because it actually helps the Fall Street Fair turn into something else that it can't possibly do as long as it's underneath the town. I'm not advocating it. Mm -hmm. But that brings up the prospect of a public-private thing where you're running it as a private enterprise, but there's still some synergy with what the town does, whether it's you know, getting the streets walled off and recreation and the cultural connection. You know, think about all the synergies behind all the other organizations. That only becomes possible if you privatize and and you open this thing up to even something larger than it is today. I, I think that um, I think that you make some good points. I also think though that um, I mean we kind of pride ourselves on the number of people that continually come to the fair. Um, you know, the first year we had probably 6,000 people, and last year we had between 12 and 15. Oh, um, so cool. if we make it bigger and better and we don't concern ourselves with, you know, how much profit are we going to make, um, 
my concern is that somebody can come in and privatize it and all the fees are going to go up and the volume is going to go down and mm -hmm. and that's that's a reality of the process potentially because um, eventually people stop you know there's a break-even point where some sure. small vendor says oh well I'll pay a hundred bucks but I won't pay two and so because it's two I'm not going to go and so now you've got fewer vendors coming which causes fewer you know their audience to break down after a period of time and I think that that's one of the, the mysteries or concerns okay I'm have. looking to wrap up here Jack and then Barry uh, uh, Jack Russell uh, 212 Gazebo Circle and a member of the associate member of the Economic Development Committee uh, who started the street fair back uh, right. long ago mm -hmm. and uh, we are uh, the the, the uh, downtown investment and events trust known as diet right. is is dependent on the profit from the, the uh, street fair, and that is that is the purpose of that trust is to support uh, events, as it says, events and improvements in downtown. And if it privatizes, there goes the input to the diet, and that's the only input to the diet at this point, unless you do something drastic to the uh, EDC. But that's uh, so. It's important, I think, to keep it as a uh, as a town function that can feed that uh, trust. Okay, uh, Barry. Yeah, one, I mean, one of the things that makes the fall fair so spectacular in my mind is that it really is a celebration of friends. And so making it, well, we had 6,000 people the first year, maybe 12 or 15,000 people last year. Bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Um, if, it's, if, it does, if it loses its flavor, of, of really celebrating Reading, I think that we're at a loss. And I think if we privatize, you know, there's that aspect of just getting, you know, let's, let's three, go three more sausage vendors, you know, in here. And then it just loses its whole sort of, you know, of what I think, in my mind, what makes it special. So, um, and I also want to echo Jack's comments too about, um, you know, some of the, you know, the, the profit that comes from that really comes back into the town. And if we do some type of private, public partnership, I'd like to see that that revenue dedicated to going back into that downtown. And I don't know if that's possible, um, or if it is, that you know that, that gets negotiated in there. But um, you know, whatever we have, I just want to just per personally thank everybody for that, for all the hard work that you've done. It's a tremendous end of summer, um, you know, spectacular event. And I think we should look at keeping it sort of, you know, not necessarily making it, you know, spectacular. Sure, sure. Um, you've been around enough years now. In terms of secession planning, you know, do you have newcomers coming into the Fall Street Fair Committee to carry on? Because you guys must be exhausted <laughs> and, and the, the original starters. Um, you know, well, that's something every committee has to concern itself with, is what's your long-term We We do have some new, new blood coming in this year with the, the chamber getting involved. Um, but, I mean, short of twisting arms and forcing people into the conference room. There's Steve would come back, I think, if you really <laughs> <asked>. <laughs> 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 It's a good idea, though. I mean, it's, it's a good idea to, to reach out and try to get some additional people, mm -hmm. especially where we have, um, if they're not associate members, they can certainly sit in on the on meeting. Well, Ed, Bob, this is, I've been involved since the beginning with, with Jack, and this is the fourth iteration of the committee, so mm -hmm. it's changed over, okay. and there has been new blood that's come in, um, so, I, I, and I think that will continue because it's a good event. Right. I do think it will continue. Great. Final comment. Let me <laughs> ask this question a different way. How long do you need? How long do you want? Uh, I, I, think I mean, everybody loves what you do, <laughs> so. Yeah, I think that we're looking for, um, to get through three fairs from okay. this. Okay. Let's go ahead. Very good. Thank you very much. Next, we'll uh, talk to the Reading Climate Advisory Committee. Uh, feel free to come up closer or speak from where you are. So I see a rounded area here. Will Finch, uh, Dave Williams, and who else do we have in the back? Thank you very much, uh, sure. all of you, for having us. I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Williams. 
as oh, you know, our oh, chair who presented, yeah. and uh, Claudia and Sylvia, who is our sort of a, a member, a voting member, and also works for the RMLD. She's our administrator, and uh, she just does great work for us, especially for her day in organizing and getting getting us into our melding and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, we're here uh, basically to ask that you reconsider us for renewal. And um, we we uh, did get uh, a letter from Bob who suggested that it might be better that we possibly might associate ourselves with our MLD. <coughs> so we got short notice, but we were able to talk about it. And what the committee came up with is that uh, while we have a close relationship with our MLD, uh, of our seven or so members, uh, three of them are actually on the subcommittee for the Climate Shared Solar Program right now. Yeah. Uh, we also work with them in the LEAP program, yeah. which some of you might remember, <coughs> a couple of years ago, so we were with them in that, which is great. We have a close relationship with them. If it wasn't for the RMLD, we wouldn't be here, because when we first started as the Cities for Climate Protection, probably about 11 or 12 years ago, RMLD gave us some fund money to, to pay for the, uh, we had to, uh, we had to pay to get, uh, uh, become part of City for Climate Protection. So they put up that money and they also provided us with a space at RMLD and a computer. And we did, we did that basic study where we found out where our, uh, where our, our, we weren't green. And that's what Gina spoke to uh, before and that our biggest problem is transportation and cars. So we, we certainly admit you have a good point in saying we have an affinity with our MLD and we want to keep it. But the committee also realizes we do so much more than just looking at electrical energy. Uh, I mean, years ago with Atlantic, we did a big thing on paper plastic, paper and plastic. Yep. And we actually had, I, I'm sure you don't remember, but we had uh, uh, cloth handbags with our logo and our MLD logo, trying to get people not to use either one. Uh, we have the tree program here. Some of you might have seen the plaque out in the uh, lobby with the tree, where you can buy a plaque by a tree. That actually, Michelle Benson was, uh, and Gina uh, and our committee, that was something that we put out. Many of our Earth Days have been at the uh, Matera Cabin, where we focused on conservation and an appreciation of nature. Uh, other things uh, we have, uh, well, our adaptation report includes much more than just electrical energy. You know, we're talking about all kinds of things and how to adapt to a changing climate. We talked about emergency procedures. Um, we have our Green Business Award, our Green Leadership Award, which includes uh, businesses that do a whole lot of things like recycling, water conservation, um, energy conservation in terms of, um, let's say, insulation and things like this. So we found ourselves really felt that while we wanted to continue a relationship with RMLD, we really hope to continue with a much broader uh, uh, understanding and working with sustainability on a broader nature. Uh, there was a meeting uh, with RMLD Tuesday night, and Gina and Joan were. Uh, uh, we were on their agenda. I think Bob had spoken to Dave about that, and we were on their agenda to speak about this. So Gina and uh, Joan went, and they spoke basically and told them in a much better way than I'm telling you, yeah. but they told them what basically I told you, that we couldn't exist without their support, mm -hmm. but we felt that we wanted to be freer to look at more things than just electric power, but would be more than happy to work with them. And also what came from that was that we would work with them if they wished to try to establish some kind of a citizen's advisory board, I, and not to duplicate the CAD, yeah. but 
uh, something of what I think Bob might have been considering with the four towns, yeah. because they do represent four towns. Yeah. We, on the other hand, we're basically looking at Reading. So I think for that reason, I would ask you two things. One, I would ask you to please consider uh, extending us. Uh, I personally, we didn't talk about the three years, but I kind of think three years is a good length of time. It forces us to come back and talk to you and tell you what we've been doing, rather than even if you're doing good stuff, you're trying to come and talk to you and say, okay, what do you think? And maybe get some of your ideas. So I think the three years is a good thing. And uh, secondly, we would ask that we would prefer uh, to remain under the selectmen. Any uh, other comments or comments from the board? Okay. Well, well said, Ron. Thank you for that. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, Bob. Okay, if there's no other comments on Climate Advisory, we will move on to the Economic Development Committee. There, Carl Walton, Chairman of the Economic Development Committee. And uh, Jack Russell is here, an associate member who's been around forever in the day. <laughs> Just to sit up here. <laughs> I had a room with you, I sat here once. <laughs> uh, please don't cut us. We're right in the middle of, uh, as you guys are full, fully aware, we're right in the middle of uh, the early stages of developing an economic development master plan for the town. And, um, well, certainly there are challenges with getting the, this type of work done <coughs> at once a month meetings at night. What we are doing is vital, I think, to um, the future economic growth in this town and um, I think um, moving forward there uh, is an opportunity to maybe expand the membership of the group and get more specialized um, expertise in terms of uh, commercial development, commercial finance, that type of thing. Um, so I'd ask you guys to consider that as, as you're debating about what to do with, with, with our group. So you're, you're referencing the letter we got from Jack where uh, he suggested perhaps a restructuring along the line. Do you want to speak to that, Jack? Yeah. Uh, the five points. I was going to formally get it out. That, sure. Uh, I have sent this to the selectmen uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think the EDC should be continued, but it should be restructured, continuously restructured until, because, until we have, uh, I think the ideal composition would be a commercial real estate broker, because we definitely need that kind of expertise, a developer, a selectman, and I would particularly think of Kevin because he's a real estate guy, uh, and an interested and dedicated citizen and the director of the uh, Chamber of Commerce, ideally, or an active local merchant. Uh, or, nomi would or nominee, maybe, you know, from the chamber, they could nominate a member, if not the director. Could right, yeah. or, or somebody that they'd appoint, that, yep. uh, but that throwed a lot of weight in the, in the chamber. Sure. Uh, I also note here that the selectmen should be very selective to ensure the best people get appointed. Jack, those are the only people we pick. You know that. <laughs> <laughs> and I say associate members should be encouraged. And uh, particularly under your new ground rules relative to uh, associate members. We don't suffer at this time. Uh, with, uh, we suffer from a lack of talent mm. to do the specific things which I think this board wants us to do. And that is mainly to market available properties and to uh, encourage and, in some cases, institute uh, new development of, of uh, uh, vacant properties or older properties. Um, it shouldn't be, the committee shouldn't be disbanded until.
until these people can be brought on board. Because there are a lot of things that are going on now that should be continued. Things that have been started in the past, like the hanging flower baskets throughout town. Right now, the, the, the EDC funds this from the, the uh, downtown trust, which I mentioned previously uh, from a source of income. But the, uh, uh, the building facade and signage improvement program has been very popular. Uh, notice one of the uh, most visible ones recently is the dental building main, on Main Street. The facade improvement that went on there mm -hmm. was instituted by that program. The uh, Christmas greenery and lights on the light poles was started by EDC and should be continued. What we really need is a budget. That's and uh, because we do pay some of the uh, expenses from DPW and things that. So it should be a budget associated with EDC, and we don't have one at the moment. The uh, maintenance of the alleyway with the mural, the town has essentially taken that over but now. By bon, where Bunratty's is supposed to be going in? No, no, no not no, that one. Up by one CBS oh, okay. with the mural on it. Oh, that's there's right. no mural that's right. on Bunratty's. That's the, there's the no narrow, Bunratty's. The narrow alley, <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Uh, the best retail practices program we've started, and uh, we've had how many people have taken advantage of that? Half a dozen or so yeah. now of merchants, uh, and uh, that's where we ha hire a expert from, uh, recommended by the state actually, to come in and tell them things that they could do to make their businesses more successful. And uh, lastly, the advising of the CPDC on signage, zoning, and other economic development matters, which we've been quite active in doing. So all of these things should be kept up. But if uh, I, for one, well, I'm not, a, <laughs> I'm only really associate member, so I can't say I drop off and have somebody of this specific type come in, but I would. Were I a voting member, I would do just that. And probably some of the voting members would feel that. Depending on the night, as an associate, you may be a voting <laughs> member. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, getting the talent in the, in the committee and getting a budget so that they can aggressively do the work that you guys, I think, think the EDC should be doing is what's required. Thank you very much. Uh, Carl? Let's follow up on, yep. on uh, what Jack was saying. And a lot of this is going to be kind of repetitive for you, Kevin and Bob, based on our meeting last week. But um, as we were talking about, I kind of pictured, I think I mentioned in a presentation to the board, uh, recapping our last year, that we had discussed as a committee the idea of even expanding the, the number of members and almost forming kind of two subgroups where one group is focused for lack of a better word, internally on our existing businesses and how to support them. And the other side is outward facing, how do we recruit new businesses here? Um, two very different skill sets needed for, for each of those buckets, if you will. Um, so I think that's something to strongly consider whatever form this takes, whether we continue and ex expand or whatever, I think that's definitely something to think of. Um, there was talk about do we become a private, you know, 501c3 organization or whatever, um, and try and do our activities that way. And uh, while there are certain advantages to that, I think there's always the risk for a group like that to uh, become uh, at cross purposes with the interests of the town. Um, you know, everyone wants their own business to succeed. I mean, to me, that that would work more uh, for like the internal. The the thing I keep going back to is uh, the group Beverly Main Streets. You know, that's a private organization, but they, you know, work really well with the town. I'm only assuming that there are certain instances where there's some, some friction there. Um, so there are certain benefits. I, I think for the outward facing, selling Reading 
to potential new growth has to be more town focused. And you know, whether that's you know, through the planning staff or whatever, but I think that, you know, it's gonna that will ensure that it's gonna stay more focused on our economic development master plan tied into our overall master plan for the town. Okay. One other thing I forgot to uh, forgot to mention that in this reconstituted EDC uh, I think we should have a director of development that was sole purpose is to market available locations for, uh, for <laughs> development. No. Uh, it could be part time, but it, I think it has to be sole purpose. Otherwise, you get sucked into all the other uh, municipal tasks, uh, and that's uh, it has to be a budget has to be able to cover that that uh, dedicated. Questions from the board, comments? I just have one last comment. Quick, quickly. I finally feel like we're doing the stuff now that I joined this committee <laughs> five years ago to actually do. We're getting to the economic development plan. We're starting to figure out what we need to do, who we want to target, and how we're going to, you know, and from there, then we can figure out how we start marketing the town to those types of when, we're, when will this plan be available for uh, us to see? Well, you know, we've got our second public forum coming up June 3rd. I think the third has been scheduled for September 23rd. Does that sound right to you? Yep. Yeah, um, this is the work that we're doing with the MAPC. Right. right. Okay. So, you know, it's, it's not imminent by right. any stretch of the imagination. But, um, you know, this, this is the stuff that the word is, don't kill us, change us. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, gentlemen, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. This is, I mean, we're at a crossroads, as we know, both in our, in our town finances and sort of where, what are we going to look like as a town, and there's very few development opportunities left. And as you know, and as you've seen, when we can control how the development goes, we get a good outcome. When we can't control how the development goes, we get a bad outcome. And so I think we have to put all, a lot of resources into um, being proactive in recruiting new businesses. Um, and obviously it means changing the composition. When you guys started, you know, you were, you were doing you know, basically the downtown stuff, the mural, some of the sign, all that stuff is great. Now the focus has changed to some of these development parcels and, and it needs a new, it definitely needs sort of, you know, new, a new skill set, folks who have a different, uh, a different perspective. And it still doesn't mean all the things that we do to, you know, because obviously, you, for every new customer you get, if you lose two, you're, you're back behind the eight ball. So we do have to maintain efforts to maintain the businesses and support the businesses that we have, whether that comes under economic development or some of that could maybe go um, to some of the chamber stuff. That, that could be a discussion. But I think, to you know, in my mind, to, to not have an economic development committee at a point where we're looking at development, uh, four or five different parcels and areas of town would, would be silly. So, you know, I think we're going to take that uh, to heart. Um, and, and, and Jack, I, you know, with what you put in there in terms of, you know, kind of the outward focus and, and, and Carl, too, we really need to do that. And I didn't see it in Bob's budget for development director. Yeah, yeah. Um, although, you know what, a lot of cities and towns have that. You know, we just, you know, we're, we're not at that point. So a lot of, of, of how government works in Reading is that, you know, we have volunteers, dedicated volunteers that, that bring a lot to the table. Reconstituted economic development committee focusing on, especially on those outward things, is critical. Yeah, go. Um, yeah no, I, I think you know Jack. I responded to your email you sent a couple weeks ago. I thought it was a, a well, well constructed email, a great thought um, to have going forward. The, the one thing that certainly strikes me, I think, it's important for all the uh, committees that are here tonight to understand is uh, this board um, has essentially been tasked with reviewing. These, these sunsets. It wasn't this board who put the sunsets on these committees uh, to begin with. So, um, you know, one thing that always comes back to me is why did previous boards decide that certain certain committees had were going to be sunsetted? Um, you know, my, my only rationale would be to think of if it's not working the way you want it to, it's easy to fix. Um, so that that's something that certainly is going to be, um, you know, uh, 
thought of, at least in my mind, anyways, moving forward. So I don't know that to be true, but I, could, I would assume that's why you would sunset something. That's why you'd have a, a certain deadline. Um, so kind of to your point, Jack, that looking idea. at it and saying, you know, hey, you know, is you know, looking at a comprehensive review of, of any board that's that's due for that kind of sunset um, is is a good idea. You know, what's really been working? What what has been working? You know, what do you want to see? You know, moving forward. How, you know, uh, what are your hangups that you're hitting with as far as being things like between a 501c3, which wouldn't be open to uh, subject to open meeting laws, or have, you know, could could email conversations, you know, uh, during the day and uh, late at night uh, from the comfort of their home, watching us on TV, being very bored. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I, that's that's also an aspect I think to take into consideration um, is the why so much that that a previous board of selectmen decided that there was going to be a uh, sunsets on it. Okay, final comments on EDC? John? <laughs> yeah. So, so Jack, I, you know, I think your letter is very well thought through. Yeah. Um, and what, I just want to be sure I understand. You're proposing that you continue the Economic Development Committee and fire everybody that's on it. Because <laughs> yeah. nobody on that committee fits Basically. the criteria that you laid out. We call it four man what goes on. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, do I have that wrong or not? No, we, you've got that all right. right. So okay, good. so, um, and so on June 30th, yeah. everybody's but, but, term expired. I say you've got it right to the point to, to the point that Carl made. We can expand and then let ab uh, attrition take care of those that but, don't have the talent. So, but what you're looking what I thought I heard from each of you is that. All the things that you want to do that you've detailed have never been done by the. Am I right or wrong yeah, about that? Well, they haven't. I mean, no, I'm not saying they haven't had successes. I'm not saying that. Right. But, you know, I mean, Carl, what you just said was well, the things finally the things that we ought to be doing and we want to do, we're just beginning to do. Is that, the, I mean, the, did I get that well, wrong? Well, that was for me personally. I mean, yeah, the, the, the things that personal. I wanted to do. Or what I had in my mind of what economic development is yeah. is what we're what we've been doing for the past year in terms of um, the EDSAP with uh, the Northeastern program, uh, what we're doing with MAPC, right. with um, their help with their help right now with you know setting the structure around an economic development plan, with the work that was done on the whole you know um, the priority mapping. Yeah, but wasn't most of that staff driven? The EDSAP, I know, was, and the MAPC, I know, has been pretty much staff driven. So I guess what I'm, you know, I'm just trying to get it, just put it out here the way it is. So. Well, I mean, the question is do you want staff making all these, all the decisions? Matter of fact, I don't. If it's a volunteer <laughs> committee, I don't want them doing that. I think that's the wrong way to right. utilize limited resources. I think but, it's but quite the opposite. But you're going to have to have some staff do it, like this developer. Uh, this this is this is I, of developer. Ideally, this is this yeah. I, I can't quibble with that. Ideally, yeah. Every no, every I do. I don't disagree either, Jack. Yeah. Everybody needs staff support. That's what makes the whole yeah. partnership between the volunteers and the staff work. I, I, I get that. Oh, oh, as far as uh, staff support now at our level, now Jesse's doing a fantastic job. No question, mm -hmm. but but Jesse could if we had a director of development that that's all he did was look outward and try and and market the uh, the openings that would be uh, that's what's needed. Well, I, mean, uh, it's, it's, yeah. I think yeah, we can fashion some sort yeah. of a compromise. That yeah. oh. yes, go ahead, Joe. Not, this isn't an EDC comment, but this is it's just something Kevin brought up earlier because I haven't shared this with the board. Um, when the Charter Committee met for the last 340 years, it seemed like, um, the issue of forming committees was certainly one of their charges. And um, the opinions on the committee, as, as you can imagine, were, were quite wide, all the way from there should not be anyone in the Charter unless it's an elected board, that's all, to we should put all of our committees in the Charter. Um, what the uh, outcome was, and again, this is just for everyone's information, according to the Charter Committee, for what that's worth, um, they chose the appointed boards that this body makes that they deem to be the most important bodies 
that they didn't want to leave it up to the select committee to decide whether it should exist like the town force committee. As long as it's town force, we're going to have a town force committee. So all the boards that were put into the charter were put in very consciously at, with hours and hours of debate and discussion over each one, just to give you that background. Um, for any boards not put in the charter, and I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with any of this, by the way, um, they said, leave that up to the appointing authorities. You know, maybe they come and go, but the town force is going to stay forever. So I just thought I'd share that background, because that was a group very different than what the selectmen are and what this group you know, usually sees in this room. Um, you know, these were folks who, in some cases, had been on the original charter committee and were taking a real long-term view, again, for what that was worth. Okay, I'd like to wrap up EDC. I, it's been a lot of good interchange here. I think I've got a lot of good information. I hope the board does. Uh, any final comments? I, I just, just one thing really quick. Sorry. sorry. Yep. I, you know, I, I, our role is, is sort of you know setting setting the policy. I think we really need to have a discussion amongst ourselves. We will. What we think, we, will. we what what economic development needs to be in sure. this town and how the best way to do it. And, and if we have to take pieces from column A and pieces from column yeah. B and mm -hmm. put it together, probably will happen. Um, that's what we need to do, but I, I think that's it should be at 11 after we have a really good discussion. Not at 11. Not at 11. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we, can, we, can, we can vote as late as the last meeting in June, although if we could vote next time, it would be ideal. So thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, Human Relations Advisory Committee. I see Camille's here, Linda's here. And, uh, Reverend, Reverend uh, could you refresh me on your name? Kayla Yu. Kayla Yu. Thank you for coming in. Come on up for. Wait, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry, committee. Save the best for life. It's life. like the Massachusetts Senate. Things get done really well. You know that trails committee. Did you, did the one you thing I get these say late nights. <laughs> you know what it's like. I do, and I'm going. Oh, I put you I ahead really, of them. I remember, you remember the 11th. Uh, <laughs> okay. All right. Should I be up here? Yeah. Yes. Sure. Okay. Take, take like five to ten minutes to. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll do this. Yeah. I know you've been here yeah. forever and yep. you're ready yep. to be we, done. We know all so about you. So. I hope you meant the Human Relations Advisory Committee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What I say? Um, thank you so much for this opportunity to share what we do and for this opportunity to, be, to ask um, that the sun not set on the Human Relations Advisory Committee. Um, just in brief, we've been a resource to the town since late 1960s when there was um, an alleged need for it. And our goal then was to bring the community together. We, um, there was training that came to the police and um, we developed into a, into a committee that listened to concerns, complaints, tried to triage and find resources for people that had concerns and um, I'm really buzzing through this. So um, at present, we've been working really hard to bring community groups together. We did the multi-community uh, Martin Luther King Day celebration where we actually had exhibit tables so that not only the Human Relations Advisory Committee could talk about what we're doing to stand together for justice, but also um, other groups in town could do that. Um, this is our mission. Um, I want to point out that the mission is not just reactive, it's proactive. It's, um, our goal is to provide education about diversity to break down barriers to help people feel more comfortable and make Reading a more welcoming community, um, to build bridges through programming, um, to provide guidance and support, and also to recognize and react to problems, hopefully before they happen, but also after they happen. Um, the next slide is just, in a nutshell, Reading is a great community to live in, but we also have all these factors happening around us, and no one can deny how complicated the world is right now. And so um, the Human Relations Advisory Committee is a resource within town to help deal with what comes up and what goes on, um, and to help empower residents to work together to make this a, a great community, even as the world changes around us. Um, some of the things that we've done recently include um, educating people about hate crimes. Thank you very much for your support. Um, I'm sorry, I'm ignoring all of you. Um, 
so we've had some incidences in town and it's really important that the town realize that when they do see something then they need to call the police first so that it's documented so that a veritable investigation can happen and this way incidences are documented if it's just frivolous but um, uncomfortable graffiti or mean or hateful graffiti um, that's one thing but if they're if it's documented, then there will be a pattern noticed, and it's important that that gets reported to the police so that investigations can happen. Um, we did a We Stand Together activity. We Stand Together Against Hate. We Stand Together for Justice, which was coordinated with uh, a World of Difference program. These are the footprints that were filled out both by adults and children across town. Zynga hosted us during the tree lighting ceremony and um, we had hundreds and hundreds of footprints which I have actually um, scanned in and if you want to see them, they're on the Human Relations, um, the Martin Luther King Day uh, Facebook page as well as on the, face, the um, town website. Um, but great stories about ways that people help each other, stand up for each other and also about incidents incidences that have happened to people so that um, we know that we're doing our job. Um, we have had visits to elementary schools. I went in and I did an activity around Martin Luther King Day with both elementary schools and middle schools. Um, and that was fabulous. It's amazing what our kids know already. Um, and they thought it was crazy that anyone would be mean to anyone else on account of the color of their skin. What? What? Who would do that? Um, so um, and thank you to everyone that collaborated on the exhibit tables, um, sharing what they've done. Um, and oh, and thank you too for the funders that made everything that we do possible. One of the things, one of the goals of our activities is to continue the conversations, not just to have a finite exhibit or, um, or event, but actually for that to trigger conversations that bring the community and individuals to a better place. And we were enabled to do that by these funders, including the funders are, are, um, that helped us purchase the portraits, two of which you yeah. see here by... They converse quite a bit, by the way. They do. I bet they have great conversations. Especially today. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for those. Yeah. Um, and, well, thank you to the funders for that. Yes, yes. And um, there are also other portraits at, six other portraits actually at the schools that were a collaboration with the GSA, the Gay Straight Alliance, who did a survey of students. One, another important piece was having ownership from the students so that what went up on their walls was owned by them. And they helped choose some of the role models and the quotes that would go on. Um, and if you're interested, um, those portraits are actually on the website as well. So you can see what quotes were chosen. So um, coming up, we have plans. We're working with the Winchester Multicultural Network to try to figure out things that they've done. They've invited us to spread the word about their events. And as we have events, we'll also they've also helped us spread the word like about the uh, Martin Luther King Day event. And they will help us with other events to spread the word and also because They've been in existence so many years and go, gone through different iterations that they are a resource to us to help to figure out where to go next and how to organize next. Yeah. And I actually, oh, yeah. no, sorry. <laughs> um, so we also have um, an event coming up that we're collaborating with the library, which is No Struggle, No Progress, the words of Frederick, Frederick Douglass, which is going to be a dramatic reading of the author's work, which is going to be a catalyst for both discussion and introspection about what freedom means to us. And I understand that his words are quite difficult and will be quite provocative. So we're hoping that each event, each dialogue brings us closer to one another. So like Leonard Zakem said, as you get to know people, you get to walk in their shoes and you're more able to accept diversity and celebrate it. Um, we plan to continue our collaboration with the Clergy Council and other organizations. And everyone is invited to our meetings, which now start at 7, the first Thursday of every month, um, at the police station in the community room. 
Um, so please come. Um, if we're renewed, we are planning to continue to listen to citizens' concerns, provide forums for dialogues, and organize educational and cultural celebrations of diversity. We think it's really important. Um, to expand the scope of our current work, we are hoping to increase the visibility through more effective communication and marketing, um, in including our first act as soon as you approve us. We already have an invitation press release for new members. We love the, um, the vote from the town meeting that will enable us to have associate members that can be appointed for a vote. Again, with the other committees like with ours, it makes it easier yep. to continue our work mm -hmm. when vacations threaten our quorum. So that was very exciting. Um, we want to continue build, building coalitions and connections and consider other potential names for our committee that are more self-explanatory. So when people see Human Relations Advisory Committee sometimes, that's not quite self-explanatory. So we want to look into that. And also consider other organizational um, frameworks. Thank you. Okay. Um, Bob had sort of suggested, just as an open way of thinking of things, there could be other affiliations besides us. Uh, we think you should go on, definitely, but is your fit better with us or is your fit better on the educational side? Because a lot of what you do allies with education. Just wondered if you had a chance to think about that. I have. No I right have. or wrong answer. Okay, yep. just wondered if you. Um, we actually talked yeah. about it some, and I've talked about it actually with some people on the school committee and the superintendent. Mm -hmm. And the concern of narrowing the focus under the schools is that this really is a town purview. Like Rakasa, um, this isn't just about what happens in the school. Yes, we have incidences in the school, and, we, and, and I'm the town, um, the school committee liaison to this committee as well as a full member, voting member. Um, so I love it. It's not about the schools not being hospitable or supportive. They have been wonderful in terms of they provided the programs, they provide the space um, mm -hmm. for the Martin Luther King Day, they have provided communication for everything that we do through Edline. Um, the concern is that when you narrow it down through the schools, mm -hmm. then you potentially lose the town network. It's the schools is a part of this, the town, but the ta this committee really needs to be a part of the well, there are two sides to it. Mm -hmm. It needs to be a part of the town outlook. It needs to be owned by the town, not just by the schools. That being said, like was discussed with the town fair, I have my opinions on that, but we're also talking about um, the, the privatization of this committee. Winchester Multicultural Network is not a public committee. They do not have to abide by open open committee laws. And so there are two sides. I've had conversations with the schools about this too, and I have been meaning to get into the town clerk to talk to her and to you about this. The, the concern is that on one hand, we have the police as a permanent member of our committee, which is awesome, and Winchester actually, um, they're jealous of that because they have to work for those connections in their town. The challenge is that we're also um, a place people can come for triage to figure out what to do about things they're not quite sure of yet, a feeling they have or a concern they have. And having the deputy chief police, Mark Zagala, is awesome, but he's also a mandated reporter. So when someone comes oh, to report to yeah. us, there's no such thing as confidentiality. It has to be reported if it, if it makes that bar. And so that's a concern. But on the other hand, because we reach out to the town, um, right now we don't pay for the PAC Center for a Martin Luther King Day event. We don't pay for our programs. We have access to town resources. Um, and if we were to privatize, then we would need to add the 501c3. We'd have to add a treasurer. We'd have to raise money. We did that for the Martin Luther King Day event for a specific thing, but this would need to be an ongoing effort to raise the money to support things that right now are beneficial to the town to provide for us, if that makes sense. Okay, I need to take some questions from the board if they have any. Yep. 
Bob? Yes, Bob. Um, I've made this comment to the Falls Street Fair Committee because they asked, but you just kind of asked it directly. Um, to the extent the town is involved, at least as long as I'm here, that's not going to stop. Um, you know, particularly, I think, particularly at this time in, in life, the police department has every interest to be involved in this appropriately. You raise an interesting point about kind of a conflict, or a possible conflict. But I can assure you, again, as long as I'm here and the chief's here, we both have every interest in maintaining a relationship. Now, it doesn't matter sort of what the structure is, at least to me, or, or to Jimmy, I know, um, because he just wants the relationship there. And As do we. And I would think, long after I'm gone and Jim is gone, that in Reading, that's not going to change unless the community really massively changes. But I just don't see that happening. Um, as I understand it, this started a long time ago on the clergy and the police were brought in then, and that hasn't changed. It's had different structures. So I just want to assure you that we certainly have that interest, regardless of what you think the best path is. Thank you. And, and the same is true with other town resources. That was a little more appropriate for the Fall Street Fair Committee. I said, you know, the format doesn't really change our involvement. It might formally change some of it. We're not voting members or whatever, but it's not like we're going to go away. So you should rest assured of Thank that. Thank you. Linda, thank you. That was an excellent presentation. Real quick. Um, yeah, real quick. Mr. Chairman, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I, I'd like to echo what Bob said. I think it's an absolute uh, no brainer that you guys would continue on yeah. uh, and are needed to do so. Uh, but it would be very interesting to find out. You know, it sounds like you're, you're kind of weighing some things. We'd love to know exactly what's the best way you can move forward. How can we help you yeah. move forward? Tell us. You know, this, this is where we really feel it's going to work. Um, so, you know, that, that would certainly be of interest. Our hope is that we would be renewed and then part of our purview going forward would be to research those okay. issues. Okay. The, is the that why you asked for the two year instead of a longer term? Um, that's, that's fine and we can come back and report on what we've learned. Um, oh, we we, just, we don't like know, later. but yeah. if we yeah. weren't renewed, we'd be, yeah. we right. wouldn't be able right. to continue yeah. our learning. So we don't want to miss anything with the Martin Luther King Day event. We hope we get back to the district art contest, diversity art contest. Okay. We don't want to lose that momentum. So is there any reason not that you didn't ask for three years or, or even two? I mean, it's well, been going on since the 60s, so I don't know. Just for years. We said know. at least two years. Mm -hmm. I thought that we, yeah. I actually didn't want to know that we could ask for other routes, more. so we could. Up them you, or they can go private. In case they want to go private. Could they, oh, they go to the school? I'm being As a procedural thing, um, it doesn't matter. Bob, yeah, as a procedural thing, could they ask to be, if they wanted to change it, could they come to Florida and ask to change it? And they, yeah, absolutely. So, so, so the years are almost. Yeah, yeah the, top, the upper end is meaningless. Meaning yes. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank We've got you. one more group to hear. Thank you very much. Can I just Thank, ask yeah, you sure, come here. Thank you. Thank you for hanging in there. Yeah. The ability of an associate to vote, mm -hmm. when will that be set in stone? Well, it's decided by the chair on a particular circumstance. If there's it's not a quorum present or if... I don't, I don't if think we have to go before the yeah. state. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Yeah. Don't you don't have to go well, before the I don't think so. That's, that's already, that's already in place. So no. is it's it in done. place? It is. No, it is not yet what been approved it? by the AG. Oh, that's right. Well, we just passed to be. Oh, okay. it has to be approved. It'll be another month, maybe. Okay. Okay. So, just as an aside, if you don't we, mind. We swear we wouldn't send them anything more, but we did. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that was... We so, we'll... Um, I no. talked to town council, and I've suggested two paths, and he doesn't care. Yeah. So, one path is, in June, you can appoint associate members, mm -hmm. but if the bylaw isn't yet approved, they don't technically exist until it is. They can go to a meeting, they're just okay. not real. Okay. Or you can appoint them, you know, effective as yep. of a certain date. It makes no difference. Right. Okay. They, but so they can attend it, but they can't yeah, of vote. Course. So, so it seems to be simple now that I know this. All right. to just appoint them all in June. But good at question. At some point, yeah. the bylaw Thank will be approved. Okay. Thank you. And last but not certainly not least, the Trails <laughs> Committee. Right Thank now. you for hanging in there. Thank happy you. Trails. Yeah, happy Trails. Happy not yet. Trails. <laughs> Linda, thanks again. Yeah. Okay. Oh, all right. All right. We're hearing, we're hearing nothing but good things yes. about you guys. Yeah. I'm Jean Jacobs. Hi, Jean. And Tom Gardner. And oh, Benji. remember you? Yep. We just Members of the Trails Committee. And uh, mm -hmm. I sent a letter, so you guys may have read that. So yeah. we've done we did. a number of projects yeah. over the last few years and have had a lot of volunteers help us out yep. and have had a lot of positive feedback. 
Um, we've sponsored or co-sponsored a number of things, including the Walk Ready Weekend yep. upcoming, and um, have been advisors to Boy Scout and Girl Scout projects around town. Um, since the start of our group, we've brought in about $38,000 in grants mm -hmm. and have uh, a number of projects that we have set up uh, for the next year or so. One of the biggest ones being the rebuilding of the Higgins Bridge um, that a lot of kids Wh use. Where is that? It's yeah. It goes from like a state lane near okay. Cape Rice Moody yep. out to the Birch Meadow Complex. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot okay. of kids yeah. use that mm. for um, coming to school. So that's a bridge that we want to rebuild. Um, we would like to remain as a committee of the town, and a big part of that is because we uh, interface a lot with the staff for um, submitting grants, for managing budgets, ordering supplies, and um, interfacing with DPW when we need their help. Okay. Um, you guys have anything else to add to that? We're uh, responsible for standards. Whether the mm -hmm. Trails Committee, the Boy Scouts, did lots of projects in the town, but they were all individual projects. So it was all hodgepodge. So now we have standards, and everything is nice and mini, and, and it's all getting done. There's the trails, there are the bridges, there's boardwalks, there's building. are nice now. They're not, okay, let's do this on the weekend. <laughs> okay. Questions from the board? Yes, Mr. Reno. Um, thinking about this over the weekend, I wondered if, if, it made, if there was any synergy between the Town Forest Committee and the Trails Committee. The groups seem at, at a distance so similar in that you're dealing with wide open spaces that you want to kind of preserve and maintain and generally make more accessible. Is there any synergy in terms of membership, skill sets, funding? Yeah, I'm on both committees. <laughs> <laughs> Aside from your formal okay. belonging to both, is there... You know, one thought running through my mind is would you either merge the two or create the Town Forest and Trails Committee and thereby pull from a larger pool of people to accomplish your common goals? Well, I suppose you could, but the Town Forest Committee is just the Town Forest. I, I get that part. It, it, yeah. That's why I thought of it as a distance in terms of just the general wide open spaces. And by the way, Town Forest st staff might actually benefit from being able to look at other parcels around the land beyond just the town forest. Mm -hmm. it, it's a thought to, do you, do you get more synergy, do you get more manpower, do you get more funding, do you get more grant writing capability than by doing something like that? I don't, I'm not projecting an answer, just raising the question. No, I, I, think, I think that makes sense. Um, you know, we do you know, work with the town forest committee a lot al already and, and have a lot of projects in the town forest, um, but I think I think we, yeah, we could learn from each other and we'd be, we'd be a stronger group if there was more you know, synergy, as you say, and more working together. Um, I'm thinking that might create some charter issues, John. I, I think it's a great thought. Uh, and also keep in mind there's trails outside the Sound Forest that they would have, pur they have purview over the Town Forest Committee doesn't per se. I'm assuming the Town Forest staff but wouldn't the stop at the border of the forest uh, and continue on for a They could. Distance. Yeah. But yeah, just, just be aware of those issues. issues. That's yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the the charter yeah. calls for a, not a... Because one's a fixed Town committee. Forest and trails yeah. committee. Yeah. One's a variable. Well, like, yeah. you know, you have yeah. But, this but it's, it's a good thought. But in any case, we do, you know, yeah. work with, like fact, we're working with them a lot yeah. more. I mean, it's getting better all the yeah. time. And plus, Conservation Commission often needs to issue permits for the work we're doing. Sure. In fact, we're going before them on the 27th for some trail improvements in Bear Meadow. Um, so, um, yeah, those, 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 maybe those three groups are working together an awful lot. Um, the other point I wanted to make about the, you know, the, the time frame, there's many times when we apply for a grant one year and we don't get it, but we, the next year, you know, we do get it. But then if you get it one year, sometimes the work isn't done until the third year. So, sure. so we really do look okay. at a, a long range planning process. Um, so the last time you were put in motion for three years, is that the number you be comfortable with? Yes. Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah. Well, okay. six would be better. <laughs> 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 we might, you might think about work on three. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
no. <laughs> yeah, Bob, you have a comment. Yeah, um, yeah if, if there's strong interest in combining the two, I can ask town council. I think it can be done without a charter change. Really? I agree. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it may require, because the town force committee has a revolving fund, it may require a little bit of a tweak at the next mm -hmm. annual town meeting. Um, but I, I can inquire of town council. I, I can't promise the outcome. I don't know. Is but that a I good thing or a bad thing? I think it's possible. Do you want to keep your identity? More or interested members. Members. More well, we really haven't discussed it in the meeting, um, so I think we we have to think about the ramifications and right. discuss it. Um, I'd like to do them separate trails. That's the town park. Two nights. Like two meetings. Two nights out. <laughs> 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 to be perfectly honest, there's yeah. a different mindset between the trails and the yeah. town park. Yeah. Yeah. I actually do understand that. Yeah. Okay. okay thanks. And by the way, we really enjoy what we do. I can we're tell. We're out there on the weekend. We're it out shows. We it does show. What we do. It does show. <laughs> and we rarely have a problem with quorum. Right. Um, no, which is gratifying. That's great. Well, there's an old rule. It really is. If, if, it, if it ain't broken. If person, I get the difference. Yeah. 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 Um, there's a real difference between trails and forest. <laughs> I mean, trails are in forest, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's All right. Any other points from anyone? Uh, if not, we will be voting probably at our next meeting, if not our last meeting in June. But okay. it probably would help the vast if we got this done earlier than later, right? Yes. Yeah. So. All right, and thanks for your support. Thank, thanks for thank hanging out. We apologize for the lateness. Thank you very we, much. Sure. We I was looking for volunteers. <laughs> <laughs> Grab a hand. Have a good right. night. There's right. two other items. Bob, there's this uh, uh, motion on number five. Did you need to have that done? There's a motion, and it's in the signature file for the chair. Um, yes. We did discover this late last week. Um, we'll have it's somewhat signature. of a formality. We have to borrow before the end of June. Okay. Um, and the, the old state law says that a, uh, a portable, is the way it's worded, is good for five years. And that, you know, that was when portables were designed 50 years ago, literally, in mm -hmm. state law. So the selectmen just have to make the motion as such. Our intention all along has been to borrow for 10 years. The portable certainly will last for 10 years. I've asked you to declare it a 20-year asset because the manufacturer states it's a 25-year asset, so that's good enough. Do have a motion? Yes, please. We move the Board of Selectmen vote that the maximum okay. useful life of the uh, departmental equipment listed below to be financed with proceeds of 1.2 million borrowing, authorized by a vote of town, uh, authorized by a vote of town passed April 27, 2015, Article 5, is hereby determined pursuant to General Law Chapter 44, is that chapter 44? Um, yeah, it should be section 7, parentheses 9. Okay, chapter 44, section 7, um, 7, 9. Yeah, is that sorry. right? Yep. To be as follows Purpose, modular classrooms, borrowing amount 1.2 million, maximum useful life 20 years. Is that seconded? Second. Discussion. All in favor? 5 0. The motion carries. Uh, can we do minutes quickly? Yes. To move that the board select and approve the minutes of May 5th, 2015, as amended. Second. Yeah, we, by the way, we have two items going around for signature after this, just to okay. digress for a moment. Uh, is that seconded? Did I hear a second? Okay. Uh, any uh, comments on the minutes? Hearing none, all in favor? Against, abstaining, 401 is the vote. Uh, I'll now entertain a motion to adjourn. Move the board select and adjourn the meeting. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks to the chair for hanging in there. Yeah. Can I see executive session? No, it's always listed. But there is no yeah. one. Okay. Second. All in favor? We stand adjourned. All right. There's two two items everybody needs to sign, and then.